Any see any Renee Capella? Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Renee Capella. Renee, you ready to be great today? Yeah. Renee, who's originally from Cincinnati, is a coal miner's granddaughter. If you've seen her read Hillbilly Elegy, you know the context of her, of her youth. She studied philosophy at Miami University for three years, but, but it was not a career goal for her, which is probably why she didn't stick around with it. But she does love learning. And she Googled the most educated city in, in the United States and found, and found um, Seattle. And she's been here since 2011. Uh, spent a few years growing her family and managing restaurants. In 2017, she decided to boot camp at General Assembly. And that's where her tech career began as a software engineer and other items in tech. So Renee, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. So Renee, um, First thing, talk about the experience of moving from Ohio to Seattle. That's the, the difference. That's a different culture, right? <laughs> yeah. I, the actual experience itself was really neat because it was um, so impromptu. Like literal Google, literal Seattle popped up, book ticket. Um, and I flew out for two weeks and hung out here. And I was completely blown away by the mountains and the greenery. I can imagine the the goofiness that the Uber driver experienced when I got in the car because I remember being like glued to that window in the back seat. Like, wow, in Ohio, it's big skies and sometimes cornfields and lots of urban sprawl. So, bustling to Seattle. So, Renee, talk about your love for learning. I mean, because I think this one, a lot of people don't have the love for learning now, right? They just like do with the toe learn that math, learn this, but you actually have a love of learning. You, you learn a lot of stuff, right? Talk about that. Well, it's kind of, I mean, learning is kind of learning about yourself. And I think that I've always had um, a deep desire to kind of understand myself better so I can prepare better for the world around me. But like when you start learning and you realize you let go of being like a perfectionist, the moment that you see a new blob of information, you can dive into it and make sense out of it, map your world onto it, make interesting introspectives about yourself, about the world you're in. There's something delicious about that. That's why, that's probably why I love philosophy so much. You dig into these weird questions and they're all so vastly different and you try to apply it to the world around you. Uh, it makes life interesting. Better. So from your point of view, what's the purpose of college? Is it like learn something or to find a job? That's a big thing. It's like, no, I'm making these numbers up, you know, but like in the last 40 years, the increase, the college costs increased like 10,000%, you know, so like, is it really worth the money anymore? Mm -hmm. First and foremost, like find scholarships and find funding for anybody who wants to go back to college. I think that's the, uh, the only reason I'm back in school is because I have scholarships. I can't imagine taking on the debt that individuals have taken on. But for me, when I initially went, it was for love. It was for exploration. It was anthropology and philosophy and all these amazing things. And I kind of felt like that was the conveyor belt. That's where you went. But I didn't have a goal in mind, and I didn't understand my world yet because I was still young. Our brains are still forming. And so now I see it as a tool. I see it as a tool in order to get kind of learn very specifically what I need to learn in order to be good at the role that I'm aiming for. And then, you know, graduate and have that accreditation next to you to say, hey, I can do this. So I think from like a strategic point of view, do it for a career. But if you're going to do it for a career, make sure it's something that you can do well. Don't just. Yeah, I, I'm not a, a lot of people shit on college. You know, no, don't get me wrong. If you're like, you're going to get a bachelor's degree and I don't know, uh, some liberal arts thing, $150,000 in debt, yeah. and, you know, get a $30,000 job. No, but I mean, I think there's some goodness. Like the social networks you build, the people you meet. Mm -hmm. I think you got to be smart. I think what a lot of people mess up too is like, do you really have to go to like a four-year private school at the, at the part, part? Maybe go to a two-year junior college, right? And save some money, right? Mm -hmm. But like you said, need scholarships, all that kind of stuff. About the networking. So I've, I, I've taken a break, right? I had the career and then I've taken a break back at school and then I'm gonna have a career afterwards. This break has been amazing. I've been able to, that networking piece specifically, just being able to say, I'm free. I don't have to work eight hours a day. I don't have to commute. I don't have to go anywhere. I have freedom to talk to whomever I would like to, to go wherever I want to, to learn these things. It's... Um, like being a part of the Google Developer Student Club, we've made 150 different events 
that have been 25 of which have been broadcasted across the globe. That's crazy. I've met so many interesting people. My life will have such different trajectories because of this space that I've been afforded. What's it like going back to college and not being like an 18 year old no more? Yeah, it's weird. What's that was like? It's weird. So I learned this has been interesting. So I run a, a Discord, which, um, and I, I love it. Um, I think I've spent most of my last two years on the Discord. We got it from 100 to 400 people, and you have to learn how to engage, right? But most of the people in our Discord are like in their 20s, and they text differently than we do. They don't use punctuation always. And if you do use punctuation, it's like a thing. It's an emotion. So I found I initially was using, you know, all of it, exclamation points, I was using periods, I was block texting, making sure everything was grammatically awesome because I wanted to convey that I, I knew what I was talking about. And I slowly learned that the smartest folks in the room were the folks who had, they had made mistakes mm -hmm. and they didn't have punctuation and they never capitalized things unless it was meaningful. And there's something about that that's so cool. Yeah, I'm going to say what grammar's going to look like maybe 10, 15 years from now, right? <laughs> they know a, 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 a course in a, in a grammar book 20 years from now, the proper use of emojis or something like that, you know? Yeah, maybe. Or like white space. White space conveys so much information, you know? Like, and all that's happening organically, right? No one told me to do it. There's no class. This is happening naturally mm -hmm. across the whole world. I did find that when I started kind of emulating this way of communicating in virtual space, that people liked it more. They were friendlier. They wanted to engage more. And I think it's, I don't know what it is. I guess it's like a, you see more friendly or something, but it's cool. That's been fun. So that's what it's kind of been like. It's been a lot of like adjustments. It's been a lot of pointing out ageism because it's there. Sometimes people will talk about like, oh, like these old folks, like old folks here, <laughs> hey. Um, and trying to communicate that, like, yeah, we have things that we need to learn to teach us. And I'm starting this conversation. So talk about your, your experience, like managing restaurants, like which, which man, what restaurants do you manage oh, and how do you do that? Yeah. Uh, so I ended up when I was studying philosophy, I was bartending a lot. It, it seems appropriate, right? Because you, you talk a lot and you get to have good conversations over beers. But the one first place was, uh, it was called the Fox and the Hound. And they had like 36 beers on tap. Right. And we had crazy nights where people would come in and, and everybody would be dancing and absurd beer tastings. It was fun. It was electric. It was a way to get to know people uh, quickly and fastly. It was kind of adrenaline rush. It was a really fun way to explore human nature. Uh, but then I, yeah, I have, to, I have to imagine like meet different people every day, great people. But I'm sure there's like everyone there's like sprinkling like an asshole in there every once in a while, oh, right? Yeah, no, but like that's the human nature part. So the other day I was uh there was a person, they had been drinking, they were working on their car, they were uh, spreading out profanity all over the place. And I was like, I got this. Like I went out, hey man, what's going on? Let me talk about it. And like they're just talking about this weird car part. And that's those are all skills that I learned in that space. You could diffuse almost anything when you've worked at a bar. Right? So you know how to de-escalate. So let's talk about philosophy. So philosophy, I remember I took a philosophy class when I was a freshman in college. Ooh. And to this day, it means my favorite class, right? Of all the stuff I did in college or school, my philosophy final is the only thing I still have left. From the first day, the professor walked in, he said, look at us all, said, fuck. <laughs> and we're like, uh, what? He's like, what do you think of that word? Bad, good. We got to discuss on that, right? And just the discussions, you know, what if, this and that. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, of course, they always say, you know, you need math, you need this, you need tech, you need cooking, blah, on, on. But I'm a firm believer that it was to take a philosophy class just to teach you how to think. Mm -hmm. And it does, doesn't it? It teaches you to like question who you are, which is what I love about it. So every day that I wake up and I have an assertion, like, I mean, you take any political question, there's a lot of them going on right now to sit back and think, and I'll wait, let me break it down and like really think about how I actually feel about this. And it changes. You'll find it changes like every month, every yes. year. So being able to revisit that also helps you like in businesses. It helps you being on a team to step back and be like, wait, are we just like full of ourselves? Mm -hmm. Or is this like actually a good decision? You know? Yeah, there's so many philosophers out there, you know, from the 1400s to now is like, yeah. like, who do you follow? Who's good? Like, what's the name of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius? Yeah. The Stoicism, you know, like crazy. Like he lived like, so far long ago right and we still read his stuff you know we do it's a lot of dead white guys yeah it's like a big thing there's a lot of feminist philosophy that's uh looking at how we how we can see the world through a different lens if the feminine perspective was considered and it's 
fascinating. It's like a whole new chapter to a whole new book, right? So who are some women philosophers? Yeah, Donna Haraway, Luce Irigaray, um, just to name a few. Wendy Brown. Um, uh, Luce Irigaray is really interesting for her work on. Uh, so, so in a question, are these people still alive or they're like they're yeah, past? okay, yeah, and and I might be I might be wrong about Donna Haraway, um, but they don't they don't always just talk about feminism. Mm. They talk about all kinds of things. My favorite is not a woman. She's actually she's Nietzsche. Nietzsche okay. has some interesting opinions. Some feminists would argue he was. He's the one who did, he did the, the God is dead thing, right? Yes. Okay. Society kills God. Yeah, that's right. Right. And I think that there's, Nietzsche is one of those philosophers you can take at face value and you could be like, wow, he said what? Or you could step back and try to understand like, what was he critiquing mm -hmm. about the world that we live in? And that's kind of why. So you had to pick one philosopher to meet a person to be him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hands down. Well, because it, it carries so much weight. Um, in a day-to-day -day life. Nietzsche had this idea, you take a hammer, you can break down, let's pretend your constructs, your reality, your identity is this giant ice castle. So you can go in and you can break it with this hammer into bits. And you're gonna have a big mess around you of constructs because you can't escape them. You can't get rid of them. So you take those pieces and you rebuild your reality. And I feel like that's what we're doing endlessly. We are just rebuilding our identity, our world around us, our brand, all these things. Here's one for you. I don't think people think of enough. Think of how many experiments human race had to do to get here, right? Like how many people had to get bitten by a rattlesnake before they realized, okay, <laughs> maybe I won't pick a rattlesnake or how many people had to eat poisonous mushrooms or, you know, how many experiences had to be, you know, maybe you don't want to go outside in, you know, Alaska with mm -hmm. no clothes on, you know, you, you know, so I'm like, how many people like died to get us where we're at, right? Because yeah. like, this is a big science experiment, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, thank you to all of the humans who have come before us <laughs> to try that out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what's your take on um, ethics and tech? Mm -hmm. I know you're big on that ethics and tech, especially now with the, you know, hashtag Coinbase, hashtag all the layers going on, you know, like overhiring, you know, just all that kind of mess. Well, there's a couple different realms, right? There's hiring and there's the experience, the, the developer experience, the engineer experience in tech. There's um, businesses and capitalistic angle, what's good for business versus what's good for society. I really appreciate Tristan Harris. He's the one who, I can't remember the name of the documentary. It really escapes me. It was on Netflix and it was the one of the social dilemma maybe. And what it was, it, it concerned social media and kind of the death scroll. That can really be conducive to well-being. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so how do we get better at ethics and tech? Yeah. Uh, I think that, so there's, have you heard of the uh, Center for Humane Technology? I want to say I'd have. Yeah. So they have this really cool free course. Individuals should go take that. But I think the perspective that we try to take, right, is you and I have heuristics. You and I have shortcuts that we make every day. We see something delicious and sweet in front of us. And we're like, yes, I want to eat this. Companies know that. And they advertise for that. Companies know that when you're endlessly scrolling on your social media, you're not going to stop. That's why TikTok, those videos on TikTok where people are like, it's time to maybe call it a day is so good. I love those. But anyway, the, the scroll happens. So the Center for Humane Technology says, look, we need to know what those are. And we need to have a protocol that says we don't exploit that in human beings. We want to promote attention spans and thinking. And I say, I think it's just understanding those heuristics, creating a protocol to avoid exploiting them is like the first best step we can take. Oh, next, I want to talk about your GitHub. <laughs> so your GitHub has been the most creative I've ever seen, right? I, I look at GitHub all the time. They're like plain, black and white, boring. Yours is like this outstanding, right? I mean, they say yes. it just, yeah. yeah. Talk about why be creative in the GitHub and mm -hmm. how that came about. I think it's important to communicate who you are in all spaces. And GitHub is like mm -hmm. our main. So developers have this. I think there's like a narrative that we're in a basement somewhere, you know, with like tied up to Mountain Dew or coffee or something. And that's not the case. It's a it's a social field. It needs to be more social. And we need to be able to communicate who we are and communicate that clearly and well. So um, there's been a lot of like workshops that I've gone to where I learned about that little hidden profile. And um, I've done a couple events on it. I encourage people to advertise themselves. It's the best way. Like you visited that and you got to see a side of my personality, which I think is what it's like to be on a team. You would you would be look at me and be like, I don't know, I don't know about Renee. I don't know. She seems a little outgoing. Or you would have been like, yes, that's exactly who I need on my team. Right and you now. make a good point. People like they were like, you know, I don't put myself out there, what it can be. But it's it's good and bad, right? It's good because like 
like me, I have no creative to you at all, right? But I want creative peers, people, right? So I would, I would be drawn to you, right? But like, suppose like someone isn't drawn to that, right? They will know, okay, maybe you two won't get along, right? Like example I'll use, when I was looking for, looking for a job one time, I'm not a big bicycle guy, right? If you drive a bicycle, that's okay, whatever you know. A job I applied for on the website, it said, we're all ever bicyclists and we ride bicycles as a team every Friday. Nope. I'm out. Yeah. You know, you got to be authentic. You yeah. got to like be able to present yourself because that's, that's how you're going to be sitting down with people that you want to be sitting down. You're going to find your right place. I've gotten jobs that I didn't agree with and didn't ultimately fit because it was more about the job than it was about the experience and the, and what do you call that? Like the meshiness mm. of yourself and the culture. Talk about the point of like um, new developers having a GitHub. Mm. I think new developers are, well, the few individuals that I, like, I've been working with, they don't want to collaborate. So they're all about pushing their code to GitHub and they'll, they'll get the rule green boxes every day, which is a trend. I think it's a very silly trend. You can like code on your local computer all day. You're not going to be pushing it to GitHub, you know? But I think that what's really important is one, having that profile set up and two, contributing to other people's work. So finding open source projects, or starting your own organization and starting your own open source project. Because GitHub's beauty lies in being able to create issues, being able to plan a project out, and being able to collaborate. And that's what I want to see if I'm going to build a developer team. I want to see that you know how to work with others and how to commit together on a repo and not destroy it completely. Renee, for people who don't know, what is open source? Oh, sure. It's, um, so you, it's like a project um, that everybody can contribute to. So there's like all kinds of different tech that's open source, um, for instance. So is there any concern of somebody coming open source, like, like I don't know, say steal the code or mess the code up or anything like that? Maybe or you could, there's kind of a process in place. Okay. So if you were to commit, so you were to come in and you're like, I'm going to do this open source project and I'm going to do this, you know, malicious code. If you're really sneaky and it gets through the peer review process, then okay. But I think um, ideally there's usually something in place that says like maybe two or three people checking your code before it actually hits that main code source. But it's beautiful because we were talking earlier about different perspectives. If there's a problem, someone might not see it, but the moment that you have a different set of eyes on the situation or a different set of eyes on the product, then you get a different perspective and you get a different solution. So open source usually is quick to change, right? It's very agile and it solves solutions the users need almost immediately. How do you keep up to date, like your skill set? Like, it's like, you know, you, you might learn a new language today, tomorrow it's on version 10 already. There's this Kotlin, Python, and on and on, right? Like, and most companies don't give you time to, you know, get up to speed, right? How do you like keep up with all that stuff? It has to be a pain. It is a pain, uh, but it's like a fun pain. I think this is like a, a, re, a rehashing of and a double click on being able to love learning because you got to be able to dive in. So just last week, um, I just hit my break, right? I got, um, I got done with my, my winter quarter classes or my spring quarter classes. Um, I've got like three weeks until I'm going to be diving into other stuff. What am I going to do right now? I'm going to look into XR, so VR and AR, and I'm going to look at Clojure, Rust, and Elixir because uh, the Stack Overflow, right, has their developer profile thing or their survey that comes out. And those are the three, one of the three ones that I don't know very much about that are loved by developers, which means it's a thing. So I would want to go. I use things like that. I'm like, all right, I don't know that. I need to go learn that. And it's cool. You build like a project. What's your favorite coding language so far? I mean, I'm always going to love Ruby. Yeah. I, I think I love Ruby because of the absurdity that it had in um, like, there's all these comic books and fun ways and this giant community for the Ruby on Rails community. I understand a lot of people don't love it anymore, but I think it's easy to read. I think it's easy to learn. You can scale up the team really fast. So it's, it's kind of beautiful. For them. Who, who are some tech people that you follow? Um, Tristan Harris right now, because I'm really interested in that like ethics space, but I really am also very impressed with Noble Ackerson. He's been working in the ethics field in product. My, I'm moving away from tech specifically in engineering and going into more of like a tech product design because I think people like me are needed in that space and I love it. So in studying human-centered design, I'm kind of like, opening my world to designers, which is different, like uh, Don, like Don Norman, Norman Doors, um, and different uh, kind of books that just kind of cover product. How do you develop well thought out? Next, uh, I think you volunteer something called Women Tech Makers. Yeah. What, what, is that here in Seattle? Is it a national organization? What it's, is that? It's national. I think it's global. So it's uh, put on, uh, it's Women Tech Makers, um, and it's, a, it's affiliated with Google. And then it's, I'm a Women Tech Ambassador. 
oh, that means is I get to do cool things like this. And I, I say that I'm a part of it. And then we're really just a community of allies uh, and women who come together and um, kind of share a space. We have a Slack, we do conferences, uh, we write blog posts. There's like different avenues that all of us do. I wanna say over the past, uh, I think it started in 2014, there's been about 1500 women tech ambassadors just about advocacy and promoting and STEM. And so do y'all like help people find jobs or just a networking thing? What's, or, like what's, networking. The, what's the success metrics for the organization, I guess? Oh, I don't know about that. Okay. I've never really been concerned about it. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm more- Just trying to network about, people. Yeah. I think it's important to be able to connect with individuals in a space and kind of like learn, not because I want to get a job, but because I want to understand what that space is like. And the best way to do that is through people. Um, but Women Tech Makers also like helps teach women who, and that's my story. I was a stay-at-home mom who needed to learn how to do tech and was kind of stuck. And I feel like technology empowered me to move into whole new realms. And I want to bring that to other women. I want to bring it to other people generally. And I think Women Tech Makers does that and the Google Developer Student Clubs do that really well. So on LinkedIn, you, you see all the time, like brand new developers are like, I've, I've applied for 10,000 million jobs. I can't get anything going on. I've done GitHub and the products on and on and on. And it has to be frustrating, right? Sure. But so what advice do you have to them? Because they like they're doing all the right things, right? They're doing GitHub, they're putting their stuff out there hmm. and they can't get in the door. Like, no. what, do you, what do you say for them? Like, A good assessment of each of those components. When I got my job, it was all based on, and I'm not trying to say that I didn't make a wonderful portfolio, but I'm pretty sure it was because I went to meetups, I went to conferences, I talked to people all the time. And in talking to people, sharing my story and kind of sharing what I was passionate about, people invest in you. They want to see you succeed. And I think I had attended and it was consistent. So it's not just like going to one meetup, meeting some people and then leaving. I went to a meetup consistently for like, I don't know, three months. And in that span time, one of the individuals said, my friend, sorry, my friend has a job you should probably apply for it. And it was, and that was it. Like hit, hit. Yeah. Like I had an in and I think, and I remember, and this is embarrassing. I remember uh, Brad Seafeld in the interview on the phone asking me, um, you know, a support person calls in or someone calls in and, and you're running support because we were a small team. So we did lots of different jobs. He said, what do you say to the person? And I said, turn your computer on and off. Like I didn't know how to run tech support. So he, and he laughed so hard. He had the same response. And I'm Almost positive. That's why I got the job. You know, I think it's about having personality. Yeah, you got a personality. About, you got and you have to show it. You have to be bold in it. And I wasn't when I was younger. I feel like as you get older, you kind of start not caring and caring more about being authentic. Yeah, I have a good friend, Kevin Miller. He's like a senior developer out of the Dallas area. So he tries to mentor like junior developers. And so I follow some of the conversations on LinkedIn. And so he was like, he did a um, a LinkedIn um, article, whatever case may be, a post like. You got to put yourself out there and make people know you are. This one young lady, she's like, I don't know what I got to do that for, right? It's, it shouldn't be my job to, you know, inform the recruiter what I'm doing, right? He should do it himself. So we try to explain to her, like, it might be fair, but that's how the games play. Well, I don't know how to play the game. I'm just going to do my, what I got to do and I'll get a job. And we try to tell her, man, it's going to, you know, it's going to suck for you, right? You got to play the game of course, right? You got to put yourself out there. Be, be, uh, even not, even not a principal, at least, of course, you don't want to be, not be authentic and all, but you still got to, like I said, you have to collaborate all that kind of stuff, you know? Well, even like the, the interview process with um, the top companies, right? If you wanted to work at Google, if you want to work at Meta, if you want to work any of those larger organizations, you need to have the technical skills. So you need to be able to study all your data structures and algorithms and you need to ace that part. But you also need to be, you know, Googly or I don't even know what Meta does. Like, what do they look for? But whatever that personality trait is, if you have it already there, you need to be able to demonstrate it. That's, it's like 50% of the interview. If you're just, you, I just can't imagine not having a personality and going into an interview and selling myself yeah. effectively just based on I can do this, you know, array algorithm thing. Yeah, I had a, a, a man on a podcast a couple of days ago, and she's a VP of HR company in Toronto, um, and Resolver. And she told me how she referred to a good friend of her for this job, right? Mm -hmm. She said her friends like, you know, happy go lucky, humorous, making jokes all the time. But they passed on it because Amanda, like, your friend is like a robot. Everything's like straight laced professional. She was like so focused on answering the question correctly. She forgot to be herself and be personal, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, man, what happened to you? Like, they said you're like a robot. You're the funniest person I know. So, you know, your friend, like, I know, I, I forgot to, you know, be myself. I was so 
blocked in on the answer. This is the answer, this answer, right? And it's trying to do the technical part of the job and, and she didn't get it, right? Well, they tell you in interviews to always share what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's just share what you think the other people want to hear yourself. Yeah, that one is, you know, that's where these people give you all these problems, right? They want to have you think out loud, like how many tennis balls can you fit in the Seattle Seattle on the winter time, right? Or there's something crazy like that. Yeah. They know there's no right answer, but how do you go through the thought process? You know, mm -hmm. like, okay, tennis balls are this size, the landmass of Seattle's this size, you know, on and on and on, right? And that's how you correct. You just make this shit up, right? They don't, know, they don't know if it's right or not. What if your key trait is that you just think outside the box? Mm -hmm. And so they give you that question. And the first thing you think of is, I associate beach balls with tennis balls. Mm -hmm. And like, whatever reason that takes you down this weird path, you're going to see that. Yeah. And I think that when they see that, because other people might not feel comfortable saying that's going to be like that individual. And they're going to say, Jason thinks differently. We need that here, right? Everyone already thinks, everyone here thinks like Renee. We don't need a Renee. You know, we need a different mindset. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do need a Renee. Yeah, actually, but yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> the, so I was, I was thinking about this actually on the way here because um, I, was, I was anticipating a question of like, what's the one thing that you like to share about yourself that's unknown? And one of the things is synthesia. I have it. And I, I think a lot of people secretly so, have it. So what is that? Synthesia is where you kind of just mesh the world up in your brain. Mm -hmm. So like when I'm listening to music, music uh, has a color and it has like a, a lighter darkness and it has um, a volume. It has all these things. Like some people can see music. So they, they see where notes are or what the, on the piano. I've, I've, okay, I've heard that before. Yeah. So um, I was tested for it and I found out that I had it in 2010. Long story short, I have this one called temporal spatial synesthesia. Because I know that my brain works differently, I know how to like leverage my world. But I think that we all think differently. Yeah. And I think because I have, and it, it's just because I took the test and I knew that I was different. If I hadn't taken that battery, I wouldn't have understood that my brain was different. Just like, you know, science maybe hasn't learned how we all see the world differently, which is why I have to share it. We have to know how each other see the world differently so that we can come up with really cool answers. Yeah, like for me on Myers-Briggs, I'm an INFJ, like only 1% of us in the world, supposedly. Mm -hmm. And I, something I would have known all my life, I recently like learned, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, so I think differently, do things differently right. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this all makes sense, right? Because I took the test and I studied, like, what's the INFJ? 14 signs, like, oh, that's me, that's me, that's me. Oh, shit, maybe I'm not a weirdo. Maybe hey. you're just, you know, special, so to speak, you know? Yeah, and there's like a way that you fit in yeah. to the whole puzzle. And I think that when you know those things, you're able to understand when other people in the room, we don't all think the same. This individual might need me to listen more. This individual might need more prompting and engagement. Like that's, and that's also how we manage teams, right? You want to be able to pinpoint those differences and like make it work in such a way. So you've been involved with tech since 2017 or 2014? 2015. 15. Yeah. So in the seven years you've been involved in tech, give us your take on, you know, diversity in tech, right? There's like no, not enough female not enough white people. And it's like every year people try to do better, but I think the stats are still the same, right? Or is it like, is it just a process taking too long? Or what do you think the hold up is? I mean, it's a complicated problem, of course, so. Yeah, there's, um, my first, my, my thought that leads into it is that we have a narrative that we're all following and listening to and where we all like want diversity in tech and we keep talking about it. And these companies keep kind of trying to hire engineers. I get this a lot. I'll get like a, um, hi Renee, we would we, let me see how great you are at this and this and this. We'd love to like have a conversation with you and I'll have a conversation and it comes out because I'll ask directly how many men are on your team and how many women are on your team. What's the, or, and not just men and women even, like what's your diversity like? And they'll immediately be like, well, actually, that's why we're kind of talking to you today. Like, oh, so you want me to be like a token on your team, which means you want me to change your team. And that's not fair. And, and not only that, usually I can, like, there's like 10 guys on tech team to hire the female. What the female have to do from now on? You can do all the interviews from now on. Yeah. Like I didn't come in to be an interview person. I came to build great products. I think it's really funny. I didn't actually realize that this was a thing. Sorry. Until um, I recently was talking. I took a gender studies class, and we were talking about what it was like to be a woman on a on a team. No one else in there was in tech because it was humanities. But I had said, you know what? I I did organize events, and I was kind of responsible for getting birthday cards. Holy moly, like you don't really see it. You think it's a thing that's good. I'm good at being social, but it's it's probably- oh, what, Let's say you have a project, you're only female. Hey, Renee, can you take notes for us? And that's, I mean, that's concerning. But in regards to like the diversity problem generally, like 
I identify as non-binary. And I think that when I, when I'm in the space of like talking about identities and how we have difficulties finding our ways to jobs, what I hear is a lot of people trying and then they get into it and then they don't fit in. So it's not about hiring. I don't like, it's about how we, it's systemic, how we hire. There was one company that told me I was going to be a token hire. That's what I call it. They, and, they actually told you that. Yeah. I mean, they were, I appreciated their transparency, but that's why you ask. That's why you're authentic when you sit down at the table. And when we had this conversation, um, I said, well, I was looking at your top leadership and it looks like you are about 90%, you know, cis white male. So you put me in leadership and I think that I can start to help make changes. Like if that's really what you need me here for, put me up there. And I, I didn't hear back, but I, I feel like that's kind of the answer I'm going to have moving forward. If you, if you would like me to be that person on your team, then put me in leadership and start there. Uh, and then it'll trickle down. So that's where it should start, mm -hmm. I think. So my, my thing is like diverse is good, but I always go back, hire the best person, right? Hire a comma, the best person is a whole lot of demographics, right? You're the best person can be a white community, you no know, black community. Mm -hmm. And plus, I think you had to expand your recruiting search, right? If you're in the, C in the Seattle area and you only recruit University of Washington, you miss on a talent down in Green River College, University of Tacoma, you know, UPS. All the diversity too is I think at community colleges. I mm -hmm. think there's a stat for that. And I, I wish I knew what it was. Um, I think I was just speaking with um, some representatives from some really large companies about how they could open that funnel to community colleges. Uh, because when you're going to UW, it's a different demographic than it is for North Seattle College, for instance. So if they could open a pipeline from community colleges to, and Amazon is also on this, Amazon just put three, what, three million or three, three billion maybe into Seattle colleges and community colleges around Washington because they recognize there's a lot of talent there. How do we tap into that? And it also kind of addresses um, systemic um, inequality and lack of equity. But you had mentioned that when we're hiring people, we should hire for the best job. And I, I almost agree with this because sometimes what people think in our mind, our heuristics, is that the best person for the job is we have an image in our mind and that image in our mind might be a white male named John, or it might be, I don't know if it's always a black woman named Sarah. Like I don't, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that we create equitable situations now. So we create the opportunity for all types of diversity to come in. And then once we have it at that status quo, once we get there, then it's about kind of maintaining and then hiring for the best because we'll have changed that narrative. Um, so I'm about to publish an article about gender neutrality in tech. And, and while I was, I was reading Technically Wrong, uh, which is a great book, but it was talking about how uh, back in the day, uh, around 1950s, when women were main programmers, right? The majority of programmers were women. Then all of a sudden, they started making personal computers and they were marketing personal computers to men. And you see, as the marketing to computers goes to men, the amount of women who are able to enter into computer science and STEM-related fields in college drops off the map. Other STEM-related fields like physics, mathematics, these things are tracing and trending with male and female the same up through present day. But we dropped all the way down something like 14% in 2011. And it wasn't until they started to realize we're not, we're not preparing young girls or I mean like any demographic appropriately, we need to stop. It's kind of like a, a capitalistic interest that kind of got in the way. And now we're kind of seeing that that decline reverse. I want to say that women in tech right now is actually declining. So I don't know where the gains are, how they're doing on it. But. So we talked about this in our pre-talk, but there's a stat somewhere, I'm making this up a little <laughs> bit. Like, you know, 80% of elementary school girls love STEM. They're very, very interested. Yeah. By the time they get to high school, it's down to 10%. So it dropped from 80 to 10% over like five or six years, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a big ass drop. Like right? societal pressures or like, what do you think the, the challenge for that is? Mm -hmm. I think that there's enough narratives right now and enough parents right now who see my kids need to be in STEM because that's how, I mean, that's where technology is going and that's every, every field has some kind of programming mm -hmm. it seems in it. So I think as a parent, as a parent, right, we look at our kids and we can say, you need to learn how to code and you need exposure. to Yeah. That. You think how much I said, if you're a parent, do you want my daughter to learn to code, maybe make a hundred thousand dollars plus per year? Mm -hmm. Or be a waitress we're living off tips right right it's like it's not close it's not a competition when i was growing up um maybe at the same time like your your girls were uh being raised we i don't remember and i had mentioned this also in our pre-talk i don't remember anybody saying anything to me about tech i had great grades there was nothing that would have held me back i do remember someone saying 
psychology and the humanities are good for you. You should go to college for those things. Do you think that's maybe because you're like so sociable? Maybe. I'm, I'm kind of like that extrovert kind of person in a room that's never really felt uncomfortable speaking my mind. And so possibly, I don't know. But I feel like there just wasn't, and it's not really pointing my finger and blaming them, but I just, I feel like I never, never thought of math or science or tech as a possibility. And I think that's interesting. I'd be interested to hear other women's perspectives. Here's a question for you. So let's suppose there's a tech startup founder right there, out there, right? Uh, he has a great product, he's been a company. Um, he needs to build a, a, a software development team, right? Mm -hmm. He wants to do diverse hires, but you know, he needs to build a product faster sooner than later, right? To get, oh. get investment. Mm -hmm. He can go to his four best friends, all white. They're gonna build a product from like in a month, like month or two months, right? But but then if he has, but he had, if you got to do a diversity right, he's going to take a long right. He has to recruit the people, bring them on. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a challenge like the people go through, right? They want to do the right thing, but man, I got to do, I got to hire these people now to build a product. And then let's say I'll, I'll hire diversity later, but then it's too late because they have eight white guys and no one else will work for them, right? right? So and how do you like work through that? I think that um, understanding first and foremost that design is everything in your product. So it's it should take a long time before you get your product up and running. And I think also having perspective in design is the key to success. So the moment that I, I mean, just, if you could just sell, and this is one of the things that I had wanted to go back to school for, I was unable to articulate why design and diversity was important for the people that I was working for. How do I communicate value? How do I tell them that this is worth your time? And I couldn't, I will in a couple of years. And I think I could now, but it's about, if you just have, let's say those, those four specific perspectives working on a team, they might not think about ableism. They might not think about racism. They might not think about any because they don't need to. And so when they're designing a product, and I'm not saying that they are prohibited from doing so, they very well might, but most don't. Um, so to have an inclusive design, to have a product that can reach people effectively, and I love having a product that speaks to me, right? I don't want just some typical app. And if that's what you're building, and that's what this person wants to put on the market, and it's going to die, you know? You want something that lasts. You need to put design and effort and perspective into it before it goes to market. Take time, I guess. I'm more of like the tortoise than the hare. You know? So talk about the importance of design. Mm. I don't know if people don't get that. A no, funny story, when I first started doing tech stuff and design, mm. like I had no idea color said numbers, right? Mm. I just said, it's a blue What design, what, blue, what number blue? What do you mean? I just want blue. No, mm -hmm. there's this X124, X6, 7180 blue. Oh my goodness, this is overwhelming. They pick for me, you know. I mean, it's not it's not just colors, and that's what I think I love about design. It's the experience. It's um, you know, how if somebody uh has a muscular situation where they uh, they, they can't hold their fingers as easily, like is this something that they can use? And this is, you know, these kind of design questions are the things that I'm interested in. That's what human-centered design is all about. We are humans first and foremost using technology. I shouldn't have to like read a manual to read a product. This is what we love about Ikea, right? Ikea is well-designed products. I think when we think Ikea, we think well-designed. We also think uh, it's going to break in a few years, but the design part is the assembly. Have you looked at those? You don't have, to, it's not like you're reading a whole giant manual. You're looking at the picture and it's very intuitive where these tools go. That's design. And so if you're building technology that's well-designed, you're building something that users are drawn to because they just feel like, this is a jar and I open it, you know? This is the glass and I drink it. It's something that we build in. So I think that uh, the solutions challenge, I designed, we took three months and I designed this thing called Pantry and it was a, a way to reduce food waste. Across. I, I saw, I saw yeah, that, I yeah. love it. It's a YouTube video, right? Yeah, I had to do a demo. But the, um, but the process, I spent two months designing that and it was only one month of actually coding it. What I noticed in tech and what I noticed with a lot of my peers is they're like, Let's get in, let's do this. Let's start coding immediately. And what's gonna happen? They're gonna code a prototype. They're gonna get their MVP down. And then they're gonna be like, oh, well, we, oh, we should have put this in. Yeah, and, and, it, then, and it wastes a time and money. Yeah. You're, you're, you're wireframing, all that yeah. kind of stuff first, right? I think that you do, it's like an iterative process. Are you familiar with design thinking? Mm -hmm. mm. So that whole process of coming up with some basic thing with wireframes and then just slowly using the end user as your moving point through using needle instead of like, a CEO who's like, you know, I, I want a button here. Well, why do you want a button yeah. here? What's, who's it going to serve? I think it's a good question. That's a tough lesson for me when I first started doing this stuff, right? Like I say this all the time on the podcast. If you ask Jason, open the door, 
Jason gets up, opens the door, right? Mm -hmm. Common sense, right? Jason develop you. I say, Jason, get up at 20 degree angle, use 30 degree thrust, you know, walk two steps, turn the door, you know, yeah. it's like regular person, you say, do one through 10 develop here. You got to say one, a one, one, a B two. And it's like all these user stories you got to do all this minute detail. And it's like, are you kidding me right now? Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, that's the way it works, right? Yeah, sort of. There's, it depends on your managers. I think your engineering managers, the people who are creating your product, are they creating a story that you can relate to? Sometimes they say, um, like, at least I've read recently that you should try to empathize with other people, of course, but I know my story best. I know how to design products and design technology that fits my world first and foremost and my interests. So I should represent that. And I think that's an interesting perspective. Could you just be a designer for Renee Capella or the Renee Capellas in the world? And what does that look like? Like what kind of specialization in design? I, I think that might be interesting instead of having you know, um, me say, you know, Jason, what Jason wants and what Jason needs right now is this. Nobody wants to feel that way. I don't think I would ever properly get into your brain and know what it is that you need. You would know that. What, what kind of design tools are your favorites? What do you, what's your go-to tool? What do you use? Like, well, Adobe mainly for like graphical design stuff, which is fun, but really it's just, I mean, books and processes, right? Design thinking has um, been revolutionary for me just being able to think like, how can you be on a team and how can you like creatively come up with ideas? These are the kind of design tools that I like to use. Um, I think when we think about design graphically, those are more like the implementation, which is also kind of cool, but the mainly just being able to have like the systemic processes in place, Kanban boards, you know, GitHub communication, Discord, things that allow for communication in the social. Say, so talk some about your role at a Google DCS and how you build the community. I love my Google. Talk I mean, four four fifteen. That's a, that's a pretty good community. That's, yeah. What, what was the number when you started there? Zero. Zero. Okay. It. So I'm zero to four fifteen. Okay. Yeah. The um, I was the computer science president at North Seattle College. I had taken that over, um, and that was maybe a community of about a hundred people, uh, but nobody was really active. And we would get online and we would talk about what courses to take. It was a very valuable resource for the people that used it. Uh, but when I learned about the solutions challenge that Google holds each year with the United Nations. And I said, wow, I want to do that. And then I was very naive and thought I could just do it. Apparently you have to be a part of a Google developer student club. So um, I went online and I applied and I said, am I going to get this? I did. And what ended up happening is um, it was a, a full year, Jason, of like the most uh, just profound lesson in leadership, community building uh, that I've ever experienced. Um, I think that the Google developer, Google, the Google folks who allow this, they kind of just say, here's all the marketing tools, make magic happen. And that's intentional. It's ambiguity. And some people thrive in that. I thrive in that. But other people get very like, well, what do I do next? And how do I do this? And, and I think because I just have that, I just want to make something that works with what I'm doing. Uh, it, it was awesome. It was easy. It was iterative. It was I'm going to be doing it this year for the University of Washington too, hopefully. Well, what's your coding process? Like, how do you do it? Like, you like do sprints? Do you do like agile? Like, how do you like work through your own process? Mm, whatever gets the job done is, is typically my route. So if it's just me on a team, it's not going to be as agile as it might be if I have other individuals. Uh, but I think I like having just a, a basic, I like to toy and I like to make a prototype. And then I we'll scrap the prototype and I will start anew. Like, you know, you like, if let's say you like build a bridge and you're like, wow, I learned a lot of lessons here, you know, and the, the bridge isn't perfect. I feel like you should burn the bridge and build a new one based off of all the lessons you've learned. So that's kind of how I do it. And so are you the type of person like, you know, code like 80 hours straight, the real project, or you like, like code eight hours a day, two hours a day, like how you do that? Yeah, I think it's more like, um, yeah, no, eight hours a day is funny. I feel like you get into these deep rabbit holes and that's the beauty. If you, you know, there's like a zone. Um, if you're an engineer and you have interruptions that happen every hour, you're not getting code done. And if you are getting code done, it, it might not be as like interesting or as deep or solving as good problems as you want to solve. So I, I like to do like a week stint of just coding, 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 coding. Like I don't go out, like my body is aching because I'm not moving a lot. Everybody should move all the time when you're coding, but, um, and then I kind of take a break and walk away from it. And I, I think that, that that process for me allows me to like get really deep 
in the things that I'm solving. Talk about talk about your Discord community, how you built that up. Yeah. Oh, it's, so I was actually speaking with some global folks from Google about this because when you're holding a virtual event or you're holding like a virtual community, it's very different from like an in-person community, right? And when you're having a forum, and I think anybody who's who's tried to drive a forum or a community like Discord or Slack, you have to have cheerleaders, I think. You have to have individuals, at least five, that are active in the community and kind of know to be active in the community. And they kind of keep the conversation going until the individuals in the community start to feel safe psychologically and can come in and start maybe talking about, they know that they can talk about these things and can talk about whatever issues, which is what we did. Uh, we just kept continually advocating for openness, uh, being able to be vulnerable, being wrong was almost like encouraged. Uh, our mascot was the rubber ducky <laughs> because you should be able to come to me and tell me, and I'm not going to give you the answer. I might know it. Um, and I might hint ways, but what I want you to do is to tell me the problem. And then by telling me and describing the problem, find the answer yourself. So I'm just going to be like, I'm just holding the space for you. You know, I feel like people really respond well to it. Talk about all these events you plan, like 415 events. That's, that's insane. And what, over, what time period is that over with? That's insane. Yeah, uh, probably from September to just like last month. We, okay. We've died off. Um, 150. So most of them were local. We had the, the Google Developer Student Club had two main camps. I'm actually splitting it next year. Um, different discussion though. So the local uh, events were more like individuals in our local community. Like, you know, maybe they want to talk about a computer science class, uh, a project that's coming up. Maybe they need to learn specifically how to work with Java. You know, things that we worked very closely with the faculty at North Seattle College to see what their students needed and what was important. But then these global events were very different. These global events were like me, 16 other uh, colleges from around the United States, like you know, Princeton or um, like Atlanta. Uh, there were some folks in Colorado and in Canada. And we would get together and we would create kind of these just national topics on the cloud, on Android, on machine learning, uh, career development. This really was like, the whole thing on GitHub. So have you always done like extra stuff, right? You always like, no, doing extra curricular activities. Like you always like, no, your main thing, like all these side hustles has always been your personality. I think I'm very active. I think I've had a couple of friends mention that um, I have been active in the past. I think being a mom, I think I've never, I've not always done like a lot of like volunteering or being out in my community, but I have always been like, here's my 16 hobbies that I'm doing, right? Here's my art or here's my music and here's my, I'm learning how to code and I'm also doing this blog. Like I've always been like that. And I don't know what, what describes or like what, what makes me that way. But I think that it's one of the things I love about myself because I'm always trying new things. So are you going to try to influence your kids to get into coding? Oh yeah, they already are. They are. They, yeah. yeah, there's um, more like robotics mainly. I think it's interesting. One thing that I kind of feel like I lack is uh, just the robotics piece. I've taken some courses on it, but I feel like if from a younger age, I had understood how circuits work um, and how you can like engineer and build things. Uh, for me, like, are we always gonna be on these computers, on these boxes? Or are we going to start wanting to understand how to like build whole systems? So for me, the coding plus the robotics is really important for them, but mainly not just the code, not like Python. Like people ask, what language should my child learn? <laughs> uh, I don't think that there's a language. I think that there's a logic. And that's what, is it Scratch? Have you, from MIT? I've heard, heard of that, yeah. Yeah, they developed Scratch and Scratch Junior is an application, I want to say. But it visually lets you kind of work through the logic, um, which I think is more intuitive and less scary. Yeah. Instead of like learning Java, where you're like, ah, I forgot to put a closing bracket, you know, and it doesn't run. And I don't understand what that even means. Instead, it's just, logic is the purity of it yeah that, that reminds me of, so i'm on tiktok a lot and i follow uh, that guy uh, neil tyson de grayson the, the mm -hmm. black scientist yeah and he was talking about how people like kind of shit on math you know i don't i, know, I need to learn math he said it's not i'll never use it you never use it but it's the fact that the problem solving skills you learn mm -hmm. doing math you can transfer those problem solving skills to anything else in the world right and mm -hmm. people don't get that I think the same thing with like coding and computer science mm -hmm. you know even if you don't never code in your life just the process of problem solving and learn how to problem solve it's mm -hmm. like you can it's a transfer of skill yeah I mean, people, you'll talk to engineers who are like, I love puzzles, you know, it's because that's what, that's a skill they developed somewhere where they understood there's something I don't understand. And instead of saying, I don't want to tinker with it, they were like, let's get in, you know, 
let's like solve the Sudoku or I don't know, look at this weird situation that makes absolutely no sense and solve it. What's some future tech out there that excites you that you want to learn? Mm, I want to learn um, more about XR generally. I think I'm a little concerned about it ethically, which is one reason why I want to get involved with like VR, um, because that's kind of like the dystopian image, isn't it? We put on this goggle and we're, you know, you've seen, you've seen the images where the person has the VR headset and they're like you know, rolling against the wall. Um, I think I want to be more involved in that and I want to start kind of developing and designing in that space so that I can see like what, what are the ethical applications of this really interesting technology. I saw somebody do a business card that when you look through their phone, they're like all their information, you know, mm -hmm. like a little hologram, this adorable thing that I loved it just because it was this new way to express oneself. And I think it's things like that that break our brains out of just the normal humdrum. So I'm also, I think AR, AR has a lot of cool applications, at least for the art space, which excites me. So, you know. so, so back to philosophy real fast. Yeah. So, you know, there's ideas out there, you know, what, what's this to do with different philosophies. Well, I was thinking about what, what ideas out there we haven't thought about, right? Like what kind of ideas there, you know, like I, I think I'm making this up probably, but I think in 1898, the US Patent Office wanted to close down permanently because they were like, everything's been invented. There's no oh. need for us, right? You know, luckily they didn't close down, right? So what have out there an like, idea for things out there, like, you know, space travel, like, can you travel by speed of light, you know, all these different ideas, right? Yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's, that's creativity. That when, I think that's also one of the reasons, like, I like having so many different realms around me and learning from all these different spaces, because your brain starts to do this, like, diffuse merging of stuff, right? And then you can think of crazy possibilities, like Star Trek, right? Star Trek had it, like people still talk about how there's the, technology the, the flip phone yes. you know the, the the tv screen you know yeah. the video conferencing yeah i think it's i think that we're 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 kind of pushed towards the technologies that we explore based on things like sci-fi and creativity and culture so start with the creativity and then you have to encourage the arts you have to put money into the arts you have to allow people to express themselves and then maybe we'll come up with more creative spaces to go into yeah i'm a big believer that you can think of it you can, you, can, you can achieve it yeah same and i think i think that sometimes you have to kind of i don't want to say fake it so you make it it's like the wrong it's the wrong phrase you're not faking it you're just starting with a prototype and you're continually building on it even if it's and this is about more like branding but let's say you wanted to present yourself as a software engineer then you make your github and your linkedin be a software engineer and then you, every day, while people are seeing it and while you're building that brand, you're becoming an engineer. And I think that these two things in tandem, same with technology, uh, it's just a really, it's better to do that than to just wait until you are an engineer. Who, who determines that, you know? From your point of view, what characteristics make up a good software developer? Like mm -hmm. collaboration, I'm guessing is one of them, attention to detail, but like what are the ones? I think you, if you have a team, I think it's important to have different personalities. So one person who is, you know, meticulous about syntax and about styling, I think that's really important. But you can't expect somebody who's meticulous about the syntax and styling to also be really creative and think largely. I and mean, that would they would kind of spread them too thin, I think. So having at least three developers, you know, three people, three horsemen who can sit around and kind of grapple with each other, that's what produces the best. I am all about, I'm like a slime mold, a spirit slime mold creature. Like I believe that we collectively can come up with answers. It's never just one person, you know? It's not just Ford or <laughs> Benjamin Franklin and these narratives we have. It's collectively people coming together and making awesome solutions because we all have different strengths. So if you want to build a great product, is it better to have a remote team or, or an in-person team? I love a remote team. Remote team. Yeah, because I, I did do the in-person. We were talking about how it's down here in Seattle. It was open concept um, and we didn't talk. There was more talking on the Slack channel in this open concept room than there was in the room itself. And I feel like it's nice to be able to meet face-to-face. -face. I think that this is important, but I can pivot really well in the morning and I can hop between different tasks. I don't have to get ready and get dressed and do my hair and put on things and go places. I like remote work. I think, and I was doing remote work before 
uh, before the pandemic happened. And I remember specifically thinking, I wonder if everybody's going to learn the secret now. And now we're all going to go from, and it, of course, is kind of going back to that. It's just a little tough. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's still a struggle going on, right? I hope. I mean, if you're a company, I'm like, I don't know. Like, if you're a company, do you really want to put your people to paying like $10 per gallon for gas, all that kind of stuff? Like, uh, someone did a LinkedIn post, like, if you want to bring your people back, you should like, you know, then, you know, let them go to take care of the kids when they want to, you know, mm -hmm. pay for gas, you know, all the things they've been doing, right? Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. I do think that um, when I was at Dispatch Bot, I was doing some like product ownership kind of stuff. And one of the things that they had me do was travel uh, to different states and talk to our end users, our clients. That was helpful. That was the best experience because I got to see how they interacted with our tech. That's different. I think that that needs to be in person. But when I'm like writing code, let me just write code. However I want, when I want, where I want, whether it's a cafe or it's in my room or it's on my sofa or it's in bed. Um, I, think, I think developers intuitively know how to like manage their space. What's your definition of, of good code? Mm -hmm. Readable code. <laughs> very, very readable. I think, and I think this is actually has like a really good business ground to it as well. I've worked on several legacy the Ruby on Rails developers are like 10, 15 year old applications. Yeah. So I think it's, you hop into these code bases and you can't read the code because whatever developer was on whatever eight hour bender and was deep in this logic and maybe they can't even read the code now. So one of the things that I like to bring to my code is I, I comment where necessary, but I mainly just make the code simple and elegant, which takes a lot longer than writing a lot of different smelly code things. Like, like the thing, like um, um, it takes it takes longer to write a write a do a ten minute speech than an hour speech, so something like that. Yeah, you need to have conciseness. But what that does is it allows your team to be not just senior developers ten years down the road. These uh, applications that are older need intense like well-crafted engineers who know how to handle complex code bases, uh, when reality, if they had been writing simple code from the get-go, I think junior engineers could come in and could navigate it, which you're, you're going to spend considerably less money on a junior developer than you are on a senior. I do think it's important to have seniors on teams, but when your product can only be taken care of by senior engineers, that's a concern. So when junior developers get good interviews, I know a lot of them complain about having to do like whiteboard interviews. Yeah. What, what's your take on the whiteboard interviews? Is a good thing, bad thing? Because yeah. for your answer, there's a conversation somewhere and it's like person, you no know, crack, you no know, push back, say, you know what? I'm just, I'm just inconvenient, however, comma, I once hired this guy and then do a whiteboard interview. Ended up, he knew the tech, but he was like outsourcing to someone else. So he really didn't know it right. So he's, now he does whiteboard interviews, makes sure they know what they can do, right? I like whiteboard interviews. I'm not very good at them. I don't do well under pressure when I'm asked to answer a question. I think it's hard. I think you have to do a lot of practice and prep for it. But I appreciate that preparation. However, do people have time to do that kind of preparation? Um, the kind of algorithms that you solve in like a Fibonacci algorithm, you're not going to do in your daily. And daily plus job. too, if you, if you look for a job, you're just not interviewing one company, you probably interview like six, seven companies. So you, you got to do six, seven coding interviews, mm -hmm. whiteboard interviews, part of different problems, you know, like how do you study for that? Well, you, there's a whole, there's like a whole market for this. People have exploited it. Oh, are they okay? Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I, I should have known that. Yeah. There's like, there's free. There's uh, far like whiteboard coaches out there. Yes. And they like, you know, you pay a certain amount of money for like mock interviews. There's a lot of free resources too. But one thing that I, good, a good story, I was hiring for um, a senior developer and I was also hiring for a junior developer. When I was leaving DispatchBot, I was trying to find replacements. And so I'm hiring these and I'm actually giving the same question to both candidates. Um, and I remember a junior developer came in and it was a Fibonacci. It was like off of Euler's problem. And it's a Fibonacci problem. And they go in and they're like, I don't know how to do this. And I'm like, well, let's just give it a try. Just like, tell me your thoughts. And they did. They didn't get it. But man, they got really far into it. And they were like, I don't know. I just failed. And you didn't fail. I actually think we ended up offering them because they had tried. Mm -hmm. There were senior developers who had also taken that problem. And I remember anger. There was also, there was one person I had asked a question. It was an AW, I was looking for a senior who had uh, AWS experience and I was asking about EC2 and they were like, I have the certificate. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be asking, or I shouldn't have to answer this question. And I was like, I mean, that's okay. You're done. Like, yeah. Why would you want to work with somebody who has that kind of attitude? He could have just said, I really don't know, but I would have gone to this documentation 
And I would have, you know, consulted this. And from what I can remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to be personable in your answer. I like people who are passionate, humble, kind, communicative. If somebody comes in and thinks they know everything and get angry when you yeah. challenge that. He should have said, hey, I have a certificate, but it has been a while since I did it. So I got I to gotta freshen up on my skills, you know. I think, and I would have, in my mind, I think my immediate reaction would have been empathy, right? I too, in technology, mm. know that I forget things and I need to use documents. I mean. Like, how, how, how dare you question me? Yeah. I'm obviously superior than your computer skills. No. So I, I think, You're like, I'm the hiring manager. No, what, if, nice. what are you doing? But also, like, you're potentially going to be working on a team with me for a little while. You should, you know, like, I, I think that when you go into these interviews, being able to under, especially if it's like a database design or if it's like architecture or coding, what would it be like working with this person tomorrow? If you were to sit down and be solving this person or this problem with this person, how would you communicate? 100%, you would not sit there and expect them to not say anything yeah. and while you solve it. You, they would absolutely be like, I don't know, what do you think? What do you think the constraints are? Do you like this approach or do you like this approach? Do you think space or time is more important? And these are the kind of things that I think led people to like really solidify their place in these interviews. So Renee, let's say money's not a problem, unlimited budget, any resource you want, what product would you want to build? Oh, that's such a good question. Jason, I don't know. I think... I would want to put a lot of that money into resourcing what problem or like searching and, and researching what problem you solve. What, what problem is so systemically awful that leads to all these other problems that we're trying to solve? I would want to, I would want to find what that is. And I think that's finding what the problem is, is like the most should be where most of your money goes and everything else should be easy peasy, right? That's, that's design. What's the, like the craziest problem you see seeing somebody trying to solve? Like it's off the wall, like you're doing trying to do what? I think I have an example. Do you have an example? Yeah. So I was just one pit conference one time, um, MIT form, I think it was called. This guy, he had to be like 56 years old. Like he said he was like a, a retired physics science, whatever. And he he briefed us like, we're like, this actually makes sense. There's no way this thing work, but this what he explained would make sense, right? He wanted to build, he wanted to raise, man, like five hundred million dollars on the first round. Hmm to build an escalator from earth to moon. Oh, you know what? Like, actually, this is one of my first like blips in my brain was something that had to do with like weird things like space elevators and- No, he, escalator. Escalator. You want to do an escalator. Not even an elevator, you want to do an escalator. <laughs> yeah, we're all going to do like, is this guy on drugs? He's on LSD, what's going on here, right? Like, and he was a calm, like, had the graphs, the stats, and, like, that makes sense. So I don't know. Maybe sometimes you need that, like maybe that's, Sometimes you need kind of these unexpected weird things in order to get you. That's like the Hegelian dialogue, right? You have these two extremes and they merge together. Maybe that escalator tech would be good for ring hopping. I don't know, you know, whatever. Maybe it'll serve some other people. We're thinking about the problem, like, you know, gravity, no oxygen, you know, how you energize it, you know, like. Those constraints. Yeah. yeah. I kind of, I, I, there's like a conversational trap where you think about, all of the money that goes for something like that and when you you could be like solving other yeah more but i think it's gonna have like off the wall problems like that to just think through it you know i think it's good for your creativity you know yeah like putting a car in space mm -hmm. all the things that uh elon musk does and i i don't know if it's like a team that is elon musk or if like elon musk is actually just himself um but i appreciate some of the weird unexpected things that come from him either the twitter account or the car and space thing because it throws us off it, it like makes us recalibrate yeah what the possibility and thing with him i know he takes a lot of crap from people mm -hmm. but who's doing what he's doing right mm -hmm. like i mean he's like the einstein uh, edison of our time right mm -hmm. i mean most people can't even handle working a, a bs nine to five job right mm -hmm. he has two like big time companies and like i'm thinking about like he's authentic right you know what you get with him right he's, there was an interesting, um, my gender studies class pulled up Elon Musk. And this, this actually put a check on me, pulled up Elon Musk, and then also pulled up Kanye West and said, like, what are your perceptions on both of these individuals? And a lot of the class, you know, had a typical, like this person is powerful. And sometimes like this person is unstable. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was an interesting, because they both are creative. Oh yeah. They're both geniuses. geniuses and both, right? and, and we're honest for those unstable, just saying, right? Right. Yeah. And I think it's, and when we say unstable, I think what we mean is that they're, 
they're just not predictable. Yeah. And they seem to be experiencing the world differently than how we're expecting people in such power to be. Well, Elon Musk has like seven kids, six different wives, you know? I mean, there's a cost to what he's doing, right? Everything has a cost, right? Mm -hmm. To what he's doing. And he's pushing limits. He's got that email that he sent out about uh, work. It's just bold. It's unapologetic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that we could talk about how that's offensive and not thoughtful and not empathetic. But just in itself, because it exists, it has. But see, with that, I think people miss with stuff with that email he sent. He sent an email out saying, no more remote work. Remote work. But I think he's playing chess. Mm. We're playing checkers, right? So supposedly, uh, Tesla is going to have to make um, layoffs pretty soon, right? Mm. So do you want to like have to tell people, hey, you're getting laid off? Or do you want them to self-select? So tell people no more remote work. I'm not working no more. Mm -hmm. And you leave, right? And then the 10% mm -hmm. is gone, right? He already said, you know, basically said, if you're special, we'll work something out with you, right? I think what's going to happen, 10% of the company's going to leave. Whatever he needs to leave, they're going to leave. And he said, oh, I changed my mind. Remote work's back on, right? Yeah, that's interesting. That's, that's, that's the right When I hear that NPR thing come down the pipe, yeah. I'm going to think of you immediately. Yeah. And another the interview you know, Musk did was pretty interesting to me. It's like right when, like, you no know, Tesla stock was up, mm -hmm. he, had, he had finally landed, like, sent space rocks, SpaceX rocks at space and back, you know, landing for the first time. Like he had his like um what's it, the flamethrower company that just built made like ten million dollars like whatever he did like is like golden right yeah. he was getting interviewed by this on this podcast video podcast and the guy was like man Elon Musk it must be great in your life right now like everything's golden right you're just a man he was like he paused actually my life shit what you like what do you mean well people don't understand how to do this how to do that you know he talked about kind of like all the stuff leading to that right mm -hmm. you know loss of personal life you know the hours in the factory you know like. Yeah, y'all see the success, it's good to good, but this is a cost, right? And people don't have to see that when an entrepreneur, I don't think. I don't know if people, I think that there's even um, in running communities, when you're, when you're trying to be very methodical and strategic about building communities and getting teams to work together, a lot of the things that you do and the processes you do can not really be evident or, or you know, superficial. And then when you have a lot of pushback and a lot of, I, th I think part of the job of being a leader is being able to like, Communicate a vision that's guiding everyone, but then having your own vision and making these two things work with each other. Um, I have not to suggest that I am any Elon Musk, but I, I think I relate very much to understanding the world differently than maybe your community understands it and trying to get everyone on board for this greater vision that you have and communicating it in a way that makes sense yeah i just like the way he puts himself out there right like he knows it and he's not a great speaker he knows people don't like him but mm -hmm. he still hosts a saturday night live right he made fun of himself right yeah so he goes on tv shows like he had a relationship with that single grimes for the longest time right mm -hmm. like you think the direct opposite right she's creative kind of you know flaky a little bit you know she talks about space aliens you know and then he's like the straight laced no science guy right mm -hmm. there's no way they met they met they make it right they you know worked out for a while right there it is creativity and science yeah the theme i think that'll be forever connected. I think I like that. I like that he reached out and had this like different, it showed a different side of him. Do you think he, he'd marry like me with some like you no know, VP of development, you know, or some mm -hmm. PhD in psychology or the psych, uh, what's it called? Uh, physics, you know, mm -hmm. but picked a very, very creative person. Like Graham, I, I knew who she was and like you, you go to a YouTube channel, like, oh man, this is off the wall creativity. Yeah, like this, this is like, oh, what in the world? Like, <laughs> Yeah, you, you never think they match together, but yeah, I mean, they have two kids together, I think. So sometimes that's like what you need. My partner is um, very opposite of me. When you, the two of us are in a room together, he's like quieter and he's very composed and he's calm and he's, and I am emotional yeah. and I feel things. I'm a little impulsive, but strategic, like strategic foresight kind of in it. And he, he balances me out. I yeah. think it's really helpful. Like, like me, I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm not really creative. So I always try to bring on a like creative extroverts to the company, right? Because I don't need I don't need an introvert, right? I got I got I got that on lock, right? I <laughs> I don't need like five people who are not talking to each other, right? Mm -hmm. He needs kind of a, a diverse set. So what's what's humane tech? What does that mean to you? Yeah. Um it's about understanding that our technology should be serving our well-being and should first be designed to be used by humans. Sometimes we experience uh, products that are like, what is this? And how do I, I have to, I have to adjust my humanity in order to use it. Uh, I also think it's about being ethical, understanding those heuristics, understanding kind of the vulnerabilities of being human and how do we ethically not exploit the 
its vulnerabilities to stop it. So what do you see as a future tech? Hmm. I hope that it is something that, for instance, we all have long-term goals. You know, we, maybe we want, I can even think of something, maybe we just want to be healthier or happier, right? These big long-term ones. And we don't always know how we're going to get there because in the immediate moment, we might be doing things that don't get us there. Maybe because our tech is distracting. Maybe because I want to play that new Diablo game all day instead of you know studying this book of some topic. So I would like to see tech understand that there's value and profit in helping me get to those long-term goals. And not just like, here's an exercise bike or here's a Peloton subscription that you can do. Something that kind of, really uses those heuristics that we have in order to slowly build me to long-term success. That's going to make a loyal customer base. I think it's going to make a better society, especially one that could support democratic conversations, right? Uh, one that kind of teaches us how to be more emotionally aware. Imagine if everything you did, every game you played, every piece of technology that you interacted with, and you intuitively knew somehow that it was there to support you for a better tomorrow. I think that would feel really cool. Um, so that would be neat. I don't know if we're going to go there, but. That's one frustrating thing about tech. Like, it's like every day there's a new, there's a new company building a, you know, food delivery app, right? Yeah. Or is tech really solving any like problems? You're like, is there, is a tech that trying to cure cancer or try to like solve the real problems? Oh, here's another exercise bike. Or here's, mm -hmm. and we're going to like, we're trying to solve the last model logistics mm -hmm. or another HR tech recruiting AI app, right? There's like 10 of them in Seattle alone, right? Yeah. Like, is someone going to, like, solve a real problem? I don't know. I hope so. I think that, again, it's those immediate impulses that are really easy to feed off of. Like, Instagram is great. I love, I get stuck on TikTok, Instagram, these things. I think that they're really delightful to use. But I've been lost after an hour of being like, have I really just been sitting here doing this? But then when I leave TikTok, for instance, I feel inspired. And I don't know if I'd like, I go out and make cool things, but I do feel like you could be anybody and you could make whatever content. And these people are living like an, what seems to be an authentic life. That's cool. So how do you take something like that? Something that is so addicting and delicious and fun and make it so that it's supporting artists and communicating and, and dealing with our emotions. How do we bring all that together effectively? I don't know. I think TikTok and like social media, like most social media, is good stuff and best. Like TikTok, of course, there's like, you no know, girls in their dancing in bikinis, all that kind of mess. But then again, like I follow people on there. Uh, one lady, Alessi Vinette, she like does daily uh, sales tips, you know, how to do, how to do you no know, B2B sales. Yeah. Another guy, he's like his 70s, he's a psychiatrist. He does like, he does like a little salsa dance. and gives like a mental health tip, you no know, Spanish to English. That's awesome. Uh, then uh, there's that guy, Darkface 2020. He did like a video like a few years ago with the cranberry. He wanted to lip sync to the Fleetwood Mac song with the cranberry, the cranberry thing. Yeah. He blew up, you know, Bella mm -hmm. Portrait up there. So there's a lot of good stuff on there, you know. There a lot of people are giving lessons and stuff how to do. Like one guy I follow, he's doing the TikTok like every day on how he's building his house, you know. So it's a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah. However, it's like how do you, when you cut it off, right? There like, was, I think that there's like, um, I was trying to do like a, how to how to become a developer through TikTok. I think that that's an interesting path. And I remember trying to break it up into these minute segments. I think it's three minutes now that you have. But I it was hard and it was difficult. Like, how do you appeal to lots of people? Yes, yeah, so actually, you can do 10 minute videos on now. Oh my God. It's up to 10, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if I would, I don't know if it would hold my attention that long. Yeah. It'd have to be really good. That'd be interesting. Actually. Some are, some are, you know. So let's talk about um, leadership. Mm. Or maybe now the question should be lack of leadership, you know, mm -hmm. like what, what type of person do you want to work for? Like what's your personal preference for who you work for? Like what type of leader? Yeah. Um, I've had a, a couple different leaders, so I, I think I can answer this pretty effectively. Uh, and I, he probably won't listen to this, but I'll definitely tell him to listen to this. Brad Seafelt um, was the CEO um, and co-CEO of uh, DispatchBot. And Brad was the one that I did, the, you turn the computer off and back on and it might work. Um, he was very flexible. He was very calm. And he had like a very loose vision. I mean, he knew what he wanted with DispatchBot and he would tell me what I needed to implement. But he had this, this like, just go, go play, go figure this out. Take as long as you need. Cause I was a baby engineer and I felt like that kind of support and that kind of trust 
ultimately led, I ended up being um, a lead engineer for that company because I knew the product and I knew the product because Brad would be like, what do you want to work on? And I'm like, I don't know. I want to do some of this like DevOps stuff. And just Brad, I don't know if it was out of necessity or if it was just out of like an innate understanding that I would do well. I'm not sure, but he trusted me. And I, I really feel like in doing that, he opened a lot of opportunities for me to understand how products are built. I like leaders who are calm and collaborative and allow me to be creative. Not everybody loves that though. Some people like a leader who can be very task oriented. I think that when we're leaders, we have to recognize each individual where they are. Maybe not through like a management test or anything like that, just through conversation. What do you want from me this week? You know? And when that person says, I just don't know where I'm supposed to go next. You can be like, all right, let's talk through it and let's figure out a list and we can task orient it until you feel comfortable and like you can own it again. As long as you can convince your people that they are a part of it, that they are owners in the product that you're building, they will be invested, they will be loyal, they'll be committed to the, whatever end goal you're going towards. And that's worthwhile. That's the kind of people I want to work for. You know? Yeah, I, I think no one wants a boss to like you know bounce on the walls, yelling all the time, being no. mad. No, opposite like 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 if like your boss, you, you work for his name is Brian. Mm -hmm. Now, like suppose Brian's calm. Now, suppose like, no Brian got mad at something. You knew okay, Brian's mad. I've done something wrong. Yeah, something's wrong. Something's seriously wrong. He never gets mad. Mm -hmm. What we need to you know make Brian unmad, make mm -hmm. him happy again. But if he did every day, got mad oh. every 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 two hours. Okay, he's mad again. Whatever. That's toxic. I, I have I've worked for I worked for someone who yelled at me and I left. Uh, very shortly after. And that, that experience was, um, it was terrible because what are you supposed to do when you're in a position as an employee, when someone is yelling at you? I don't think that leaders understand, maybe even parents don't understand that when you're yelling at a child or you're yelling at an employee, you, the employee doesn't have power to stand up for themselves, to tell you like, you're disrespecting me and that's crossing a boundary I'm not comfortable with. In my situation, I did say that. And then I got yelled at more for standing up for myself, even though it was calm. And I think that's, um, that's a power dynamic I'm not comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. Next, talk about your parenting. Yeah. So you have three kids, right? Yeah. Like you just have to say 10, seven, or four? Mm, close. Yeah. Yeah. Seven, seven, nine, and 10. I also okay, seven, nine, struggle and 10, okay. with ages. And, uh, and the, the girls, boys? There are two boys okay. and then one girl. And um, I'm the biological parent of the boys, mm. the, uh, the seven and the 10 mm. year old. And um, I co-parent. I co-parent very successfully. I'm very proud of what we have accomplished. We separated, um, maybe the boy that my oldest boy was about five. Uh, we had separated and it was the most amicable, calm, like this doesn't need to be a legal battle. We care about each other. We care about these kids. There was still some animosity, but it's been what, like five years now. And we just, we kill it. We do a really good job of, he's military. He's in the Navy and the uh, diver in the Navy. And he right now is actually on a road trip with the boys. He's bringing them back to Seattle. I haven't seen them for about six months, maybe a year. And the boys will stay with me until they're 18 or until Caleb gets stationed here. And then we can go, we can have a more equitable, you know, time for each of us. So do you kids do the, you know, daddy versus mommy thing? Oh, like trying to pin us? Yeah. No, because no. we're so communicative. Mm -hmm. They know that Caleb and I are like on the phone always. Mm -hmm. We're always talking. Um, also my my partner, Andrew, is always talking with like, it's like a, it's like a ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, we all understand that we're all, none of the kids can, can manipulate it. Doing this cocoon, right? Yeah, because we're too, we're too solid. But we, uh, we try to do engineering processes and um, kind of this like agile, iterative approach to parenting as well, which is kind of silly when I say it out loud. But we really think that two of our children um, kind of need tasks and need mm -hmm. reminders and to-do lists. So we have uh, Kanban boards all over our house. We have um, all kinds of different processes set up to make sure that they succeed every day. Well, yeah. It isn't fun like you know, kids can be uh, growing up in the same house all 18 years, but have completely different personalities, like yeah. different interests. I mean, like even twins, you know, they have different interests, different things, you know, it's just mm -hmm. crazy how they didn't, but they have the same parenting skills, same everything the same, and they're like just so vastly different. Yeah, that was humbling for me when I, because my two are very different. And I think... When I had my one, what do you call those parents? Singleton parents? When I had my one, I thought everything I did shaped this child. And I had this like, you know, upstanding sense of like, what, what is a good parent versus what is a bad parent? And then my other one came out and the other one was just, I was doing the same things and he was responding so differently. 
And now that I have these, it's an interesting dynamic. I've just been like, you know, I'm just here to support a psychologically safe space for both of you. And you're going to figure it out. And we're going to have fun in the process. So I'll tell you my answer if you give me yours. Okay. What's your definition of a good parent? Ooh, you want to go first? Look, I'll go first. Okay. So most people think a good parent is like, no, my kids has a hundred thousand dollar job. They're happy. Mm. They're a doctor, blah, 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 you know, and if I think to me, I used to think like that, but now I think, okay, you're a good parent. If when your kids leave your house or are grown up, they contribute to society versus taking away. Mm. So contribute can be simple. Some of the simplest having a job, paying taxes, right? Yeah. So contributing, taking away is like, you know, they're in jail, they're robbing people. They're on the system all their life, you know, you know, so they're taking away, right? So to me, it's like that. I hear that. Answer. I disagree a little bit. I think that if my kids are still talking to me when they're in their 20s and in their 30s, if we still have a good relationship then I've done something right, because I, I think I know that just from my own experiences, sometimes you have to take a bad path. Sometimes you don't make the right decisions. But if the child or, you know, the you know, adult doesn't have anyone to go back. They don't, they feel so alienated that they can't talk to their parents. And I think that's one of the, just the biggest tragedies because you're supposed to be fostering this great relationship. If I've done it right, I've created a space where my kids feel happy and comfortable and safe, where even if they're not happy, they're still safe and able to talk to me. So when they are like 40, you know, or 30 or 20, and they have things going on, they need to know what I've told them. They can always come to me. And we can sit down and talk and there's, there's no, there might be judgment, but it's like open transparency, talk it out, you know? Yeah. 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 So I have this other philosophy too, and tell me what you think. So I'm a big believer that if you don't have your kids raised like you want by the time of 13, it's too late, right? But the time, I think by the time of 13, peer pressure takes over, friends take over, TV takes over. I think 13 age were like, you know, they're, the ethics are the ethics, right? The press they are, mm -hmm. the press they are when they, when they turn 13, right? So. Mm -hmm. You haven't like spent years like born from birthday from born day to 13, like you start on the values you want them, like teach them what you want to have them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think you, you can teach a kid, oh man, my son's 16, I need to teach how to be a man, or my daughter's 14, I need to teach me, you know, how to make sure people respect or whatever, right? Yeah. I think 13 is the age. So that's my point of view. Mm. Well, I've had um, a life experience that I think speaks otherly. So when I was five, my mom died mm -hmm. and I felt very lost and confused and grieving for like 20 years. It was a pretty long, and I was not not the most empathetic, not the most, I was very extroverted and very happy and very my, me, but my values hadn't been developed mm -hmm. until I finally was able to get rid of this yeah. abandonment thing. And when I got out of that, it wasn't until my mid twenties, easy. And that's when I realized um, after I'd explored all these different modes of reality that uh, this is who I am and this is what I wanna live for. And, you know, so I think we all take different paths. I do think that the formative years, I think they've said psychologically it was one through five. That's the personality forming. And then, um, you know, I can see how the moment that you lose them at 13, the moment that media and peers and all those other influences, mm -hmm. I think we do, we lose, we lose a little bit of our, but hopefully, hopefully they continue that hard work, you know, on their own. I can't say that everyone does. Yeah. Talk about the points of personal growth. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, failure is really important to building um, good perspective. I, I, I didn't finish when I went to philosophy to Miami University for philosophy. And because I didn't finish, you better believe I finish everything now because I've lived with the regret of not continuing that. Um, relationships, when you fail in relationships, you kind of learn how you're supposed to get through it. Uh, the hardest part I think is getting over regret. I think that that can be one of the biggest punishers, especially when you get older and you're looking back at your life and you're like, oh my gosh, I've made all of these incalculable mistakes that have led to this present moment. Um, the only thing that you can do in that moment is to take another step, but in the right direction, right? And I, I think that's very hard. And if you have the right support system, you're good. I know a lot of people will say, you know, there's no such thing as failure, just learning. Mm. Sometimes I'll be like, man, I'm tired of learning. I want to succeed. I'm tired <laughs> of learning all the time. I want to be successful at something. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm like probably constantly failing. I think I'm really aware of it too. And every decision I make is potentially a failure. And I think you just have to like be not afraid of it. Yeah. This is a guy I follow. He's like a big time product manager out of the Bay Area, Hinshaw. Mm -hmm. He says his goal is every day is to be less wrong today 
less wrong tomorrow than it was today. This is called every day, like less wrong. Yeah. Life's tough. There's a mantra that I kind of carry with me and it's just be a better human. That changes it. Being a better human was different for me five years ago than it is today. But like when I am in my kitchen and I'll, it's just a habit now I'll hear myself say, be a better human. I'm like, all right, I'm not doing dishes. you know, or um, be a better human. I'm going to rinse out the recycling. So like, do, you, do you ever say I'd be a better human? But not today. <laughs> not today. Not, not today. Right not today. I'm pretty good at like giving in to myself. <laughs> but there's absolutely a feeling of like, I don't want to, you know, like I, I, that you can feel this sense of like being a better human is hard. Um, and sometimes I guess maybe I probably do. But what, what's some things in your bucket list? Mm, I don't know. I think that I've, this sounds kind of silly. I'm not saying that I've lived everything, but it doesn't have to do with like traveling. It doesn't have to do with like living big experiences. I, this is little, I really want to work for a company that is like, just has resources and power and is like making something big impact. Like I, I want to be a part of a team that knows more than I do. And I'm not saying the teams I have been on, I've known more, but you know that feeling when you're with a team of people who all want to just kill it or excel I shouldn't say kill it's not an appropriate word but those kinds of vibes I just want to be on a team of those people like and I want to be in the hall and I want to learn from all of them uh, and I think that that kind of experience I, I have some ideas of where it might be I'm really interested in the Google associate product manager program um, I think I have got two years to prep for it and so I've, I've been working on that because I think that those that's 45 people from around the globe who join that cohort each year and that's the kind of people that I want to be with. And I feel like that's a bucket list item, just to be a part of greatness, to apply our skills, to make something amazing. Do you think you'd ever start your own, own company, own start, tech startup? I've been told that I would be very like, good Like maybe an XR tech startup? <laughs> maybe, maybe. I think, um, I think I like, I like creating things and I like building teams to build amazing things and get projects done. But I don't, I don't, I can't think of, what that idea would be. I wouldn't even know how to get the funding. And there's all these like roadblocks. So on one of my things in my back of my mind is maybe someday I'll go get like an MBA when I'm like ready and I want to take that space. But it's, I don't, I don't feel confident in it, you know? That's kind of surprising. You're not confident in something. <laughs> you feel like you'd be confident in anything. I mean, I think that if you were to dump me into a space and you didn't tell me that I was being a CEO, I would, I would do amazing. But I think the moment it's like we get ahead of ourselves or we get in our own way. That's sort of how I feel, at least especially about, and there's so much risk. Like what if, I don't know, all the time and the energy that I would want to be putting towards other goals into a business, it's not ready. It's not time yet. So what's this degree you're getting right now? What's it called? Human Centered Design Engineering. What made you decide to get this degree? Uh, I mean, you already, you already had a successful software developer. Yeah. Why? What, what is this degree? What can you do with it? The mm -hmm. whole nine yards. So I had that experience of being yelled at. And I also was having an experience at the time with in, an inability to communicate. Now, before you go, I could be wrong, but University of Washington has like top program of this, right? Like yes. the number one program, right? Yes. They're so like number one. There's Carnegie Mellon, which is also mm -hmm. really good. Um, but this So it's is, not like you're going to like North Dakota Institute Tech of Farming to do no. learn design or, you know, or... Odessa Junior College learners out. You're going like the number one top school. It's a big deal to even get in. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We, I worked really hard to get into this program. And it, um, it essentially is learning design, but being empathetic and, and understanding equity and kind of designing products differently than how we experience them today. Um, I'm very excited to be a part of the program. And I'm very, the people that in it just make amazing things. You know, what I see going into this program is gorgeous. What's the name of the lady there? I can't think of her name, but she like she helps uh, people get internships at the school. I'm not sure. I have to look it up and give it to you. I can't think of her name. Everybody has been really helpful yeah. so far. Um, I've talked to a lot of the advisors. I've connected, of course, with all of the masters and graduates or all the graduate students in the program. Um, everybody, all they say about it is like, you know, you are going to have such a great time. That's the, the vibe. And they can never really quite tell me why, mm -hmm. but it's like this exciting roller coaster that I'm getting on. But I left engineering because I was, I was kind of doing product management, I think, at my, um, the role that I was at DispatchBot. But I felt not so sure about how to create a good product. And I also had lots of things coming in from the C-suite of like, we want this and we want this and we want this. And I was like, but why? And have we talked to our clients? And do we know? Like, and I, I wasn't able to have that 
process and have that power in myself. So I stepped back and I decided to go back to school and get prerequisites at North Seattle so I could enter this program. There was a book that my partner got me, Value Sensitive Design. This book is about designing a product and thinking about not just the um, stakeholders that are included, but also the excluded stakeholders. How does your product or your whatever that you're building, how is it going to affect the people that are not being considered? Is it going to be ethical or is it going to destroy cities? Like this, these long, deep, deep philosophical questions. Um, and I was blown away. Like, yes. And I remember reading and it was like University of Washington. And I was like, all right. So I went and I Googled it. The Value Sensitive Design Lab is part of the informatics school, but the informatics school um, isn't one of the best programs in the United States. The Human Centered Design Program also kind of holds that space with value sensitive design. And so I started Googling and I started looking at it and the classes that are offered are so cool. Um, they talk about ethics. They have a society ethical program. Like there's so much more consideration. I think, I think coming out of this program is going to make me a very well-rounded product manager. Um, as you can tell. I'm so is that you go to be a product manager, like a big time tech company? Yeah, yeah, essentially. So, I mean, I think that you can make big things on small teams too. And I'm, I, that's my specialty right now is working with small teams. But I've been through the Google Developer Student Club. I'm, I'm the one that collaborates and gets all these other leaders from other schools together to do and kind of runs the project. Right. And it's been interesting. And so you're trying to back VP a product as some kind of department of Google? That would be so great. Wouldn't that be beautiful? I mean, I think, I don't know if I'm ready for that sort of thing, but I think being able to think about big pictures, I don't have the audacity to say that I can think really high level about these complicated things, but I think that you, I understand how to go about finding all these intricate details and how to take all of these things and weigh them into consideration and make really good business decisions. It's just why I'm back at school. I want to be good at it. You're a full-time student? Yeah, it's lovely. Is, 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 are they still remote or are they actually in class now? We're in class. In yeah. class. Mm -hmm. That's been a great experience. It is. I got, we, uh, Andrew got me this little uh, scooter from mm -hmm. Vroom Vroom and we've been going to UW. So we live in Edmonds mm -hmm. and I'm going to take the light rail down my little Vroom Vroom. And then I have a helmet. It's mm -hmm. like our agreement. So I'm going to be on campus with my helmet. And I was finding and mapping out all of my pathways to class. It's going to be, I'm excited. Anything in college, like the college experience you weren't expecting, like mm -hmm. kind of surprised you? No, I, I was really surprised by calculus. I had never, I was a philosophy student. I skipped math, Jason. I was able to do logic to get my math credit when I first went to school. So when I was doing my prerequisites for this program, they were like, so you got to do calculus. <laughs> I was like, I don't wanna. I think I had done algebra in high school. So when I started taking these calculus classes, man, I was, I was definitely thrown for a loop. I still, I mean, I got a good grade. It was okay. But I, I think I have to take Calc 3 in the next couple of quarters and I'm terrified. It's just... Yeah, I touched about this a couple of days ago. So in high school, I did I was only did algebra one, made yeah. like a D plus. <laughs> in college, I took like bullshit math classes, right? You know, mm -hmm. no algebra, nothing, right? So I went to get my master's human relations. Very first class was stats. And that shit kicked my ass. I don't know how stats I passed that class. Hard. I, I, have, I still don't have an idea how I passed that class. Because all the equations seem like they're the same equations. Yeah. And you're like, but what's the difference again? I... Yeah. Oh. There's that, they were, they were suggesting I could take stats for calc and I was like, maybe calc. Yeah. <laughs> that's complicated. That's what's hard. That's what's hard. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so you knew your bachelor's degree from there, right? Mm -hmm. VP of product at Google, maybe just go. Yeah. I still think you'd be a good startup founder. Maybe. Um, so I need to connect with this friend of mine. Her name is Mary Rossi. She's a military spouse too. Mm -hmm. uh, so she had, she still has a creative design company, but she got hired, I think two years ago. So you know the Sims game? Mm -hmm. She she's rebranded the whole entire Sims game. Wow. Yeah, so they rebranded the whole thing, right? That's beautiful. That's pretty cool. I mm -hmm. think y'all two y'all two would definitely get along. Yeah. There's something to be able to take a product. I hear about, and this is what I've been paying attention to more than like engineering is I hear about people who are like taking over products and rebranding it and reformulating it and getting new teams in. And I have so much admiration because I know you need work and thought and research that goes into organizing all these teams to get that kind of stuff done. And with her, she had a tough decision because her, her company had a creative design, I can't remember the name of the company, creative brand, creative design branding. And she was taking off like, she was like, they like really make it big. Mm -hmm. offered the job, like, you know, like how do you turn down Sims, right? I mean, like you do the job, you successful, work the two years, that's on your resume, right? Yeah. You tell people anywhere, hey, I, I re-ran Sims. See that Sims game? That's me, right? They're gonna know. 
I was like, how do you beat that? Right. I mean, so. I love those experiences too, where you can, that's, and that's one of the reasons we started a Google developer student club at North. I think in my mind, I knew that college community college students were talented and a lot of them really are, but they don't necessarily get the recognition for being because they're not at like a official institute. And so institution, and it was like, let's, let's do this. Let's get this Google brand. Let's get on a platform. Let's take it as an opportunity and let's make names. And we did. Um, our, our group, there's about five or six of us, ended up being the most active across all of North America. That's huge. And they're just, we're just, you know, five or six community college students. I think that that's a really inspirational story. And it's one that I'm going to take with me. It doesn't, it doesn't matter as long as your team like, wants it and is willing to dream big and go for it. What, what do you do for fun? Hmm, I play I play video games with you, my family. <laughs> what kind of games? Right now we're playing the, Diablo because it's very addictive. The stereotypical computer science nerd, right? Right. But I mean, so what we're doing, I told you about Dragon Week. Mm -hmm. One of the things I do as a parent, because you have to, yeah, I have to find ways to keep myself engaged with parenting. It has to be fun for me too. And I like to do these really cool, I have my whole house uh, wired up with Philips cue bulbs. And I like to, so one time we turned, we took the kids out back near the river and Andrew had like left his backpack and supplies on the river because he was lonely. And in his backpack, he had this journal about this other dimension. And there was this like device with a light switch and there was a potato. And so I was like, okay. And there, I was like, don't, don't press the light switch. And of course, all of them are like, we're going to press it. And I'm making sure that they're not looking at the house. And I have my phone and I'm like changing the phone to blue. So the whole, all the entire house is changing blue and they've switched it. So when they switch it, I'm like, oh my gosh. And they all look up on, you know, cause they're behind this. I like, told you not to do theater. that. Yeah. And like the house is blue. We're all, oh my gosh. And then we all like creep back and we had a fog machine going that we hooked up to the central air system. So now it's foggy and it's blue. And the kids are going in and we see this big pile of baking, it's baking soda, but I tell them like, I feel it. And we're looking at the journal and the journal says, it's like a monster that eats people and animals and turns them into dust. And so Andrew is lost and he can't get back. We have to go find him. And he's somewhere in this blue dimension, which is not home. And it's so cool to be able to have these like experiential right now I'm doing dragon week. Uh, we're going to have a dragon. It's a stealth dragon and it lives in the back part of the woods. I just made, I took a giant Easter egg. I covered it with hot glue. I painted it. I put a little stuffy dragon in there and they're going to find this egg every day. They're going to wake up and the egg is going to get a little bluer because it's going to be dying and they need to get it back to their mom. And we also have aliens that visit us come in our oven. They're the children of N and they, the planet's name is N and they like to put things in the oven, like dinosaurs that walk around and Stuff. Your kids, they get older, you'll be like, man, we had the greatest childhood ever, or man, or they're going to be traumatized for life. They're going to be like in some kind of mental health breakdowns. Oh my goodness, we live in aliens and blue eggs, and my mom yeah. exposed us to stuff. Mm -hmm. There was one time, I think it, it was a little bit too far. We had uh, shut the power off in the middle. It was like right when they were going to bed. Mm -hmm. And so all of them, they're giggling and talking and playing in their rooms. And then we shut the power off. We had the fog machine going because it's critical. And I'm in downstairs coding in a tent. We always have pop-up tents in our house. So I'm coding in the tent and like, they're scared. They're like, something has happened. We had like scary music playing. So they haven't caught on yet. They haven't caught on yet. And that's, that's the magic. I think I'm really into magical realism. Yeah. When they figured out, it's just going to be a disappointing day for you. Well, I mean, when they figured out, you're going to be like, oh my goodness. They figured it out. It's, they don't figure it out immediately mm -hmm. during the process. Mm -hmm. There was one, the blue dimension one. I remember Iona like looking up and being like squinting at me and being like, this isn't this isn't real. This isn't real. And she was like, okay. And then she, they get into it. Mm -hmm. The youngest one, we had uh, one where Andrew had transformed into a werewolf or Bigfoot or something. He had a big suit and they had to go find these hidden treasures. And there was a map outside and it was a full moon, yada, yada. So they went outside and the littlest one is scared because, because Andrew had laser tag and he was, <laughs> so he was like, the littlest one is running and he gets trapped by branches right and it's dark out and he's screaming oh, man. he thinks right and i immediately of course like swoop it and i'm like it's okay it's just a joke it's gonna be fine and he was fine after that but that blood curdling scream to this day he'll tell you it's great i love these things but he was he was terrified in that moment and i think that because of that that was one of the first ones we did and i've been a lot more careful about not making maybe, sure maybe not too realistic yeah making it like 
a little bit fun, like that curious, the world just shifted. Something weird is happening. And then. So this might be too much for you to do, but have you all thought about videotaping this and like posting on YouTube? Like that, that would be hard. Like, like the adventures, you know, the pranks on our family or whatever the case may be. I think y'all would blow it up on that stuff. I think that would be really fun. And, and they do like a background video, like how the science works, how the baking soda works. You know, this is what we're doing to our kids. They don't suspect a thing. <laughs> I would love it. Or like this one thing on TikTok and, and this girl, I'm sure it stays because there's no way this young lady fosters every time, right? Yeah. So it's a, a husband and a wife and a daughter, right? They go like they go to the, the, the auto parts store and they'll say, "Hey, go in there and buy me some tire, some air tire, you know, or something that's off the wall. You can you don't buy air tire, right? Or yeah. just something like no, something off the wall. You don't do this, right? You got me again. I can't believe it, right? So there's no way this girl is like you know it has to be staged, right? Just a funny thing, right? Every time, go get this off the wall thing, you know. I hate you guys. Oh, that's sad though. Maybe yeah. it, maybe like maybe it is. Maybe she does get tricked every time. I think that that would be. Have you seen that TikTok phenomenon where people? It's called like interactive sleep. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't know how I got into this like dark corner of life. But if you know, Ross, there's so many. There's like food TikTok, dance TikTok, oh, psychology TikTok. Yeah. You know, any anything you think of is that TikTok. You know, tattoo TikTok. You know, verbal TikTok. Them. This one is not, this one, I saw it yesterday. So it's like, I hadn't been on TikTok for a while and we're looking through, I look at like funny animal videos with my kids, but this one was somebody sleeping and then they, the individuals like you can send in gifts or something on live. I don't, I don't actually do it. So I don't know, but they could send in an emoji or a heart or a gift or something. And then like they've programmed it where it'll scream or flash a light mm -hmm. or do something loud to wake up the person that's sleeping. And it's just like eight hours of somebody being essentially like tortured. I, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about it either. I also don't know if it was real. Mm -hmm. And so it was this weird feeling of like, uh, are, are you okay? <laughs> like, do I need to reach out to somebody? For yeah. You? Yeah. And that's strange. So I know you say you like, you like drink scotch. There's a mm -hmm. channel on TikTok. There's like, where they, every day they review a different scotch. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name, but I'll forward to you once I find it. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Scotch is delicious. Um, so how do you take care of yourself? How do you make sure you don't like burn yourself out and, you know, drive yourself crazy? I think having all those different interests, right? I can do a charcoal um, and then I could learn about XR and then I can go play some Jan Tiersen on a piano and then I can go parent really well for a minute, making some cool elaborate scene for them. And I think being able to pivot between these things allows my brain to diffuse but also um, someone had once told me like you, your time management skills are through the roof. And I, I actually don't feel like I have a lot of downtime and maybe that is a credit to me, but I feel like it's because I pace everything out and I, I can see it and, you know, in my brain for the next like three months, these are the things I'm doing. And this is the energy and when I need to allocate it. Uh, I don't feel overstressed at, at all. So how often do you sleep each night? Mm, I, have, I have to get nine hours. Nine hours? I have to get nine hours. If I don't get nine hours, I'm sad the next day. I'm unable to function. I'm usually cranky. So you're a morning person, night owl? Night, night owl? Yeah. Um, I like, I feel like, um, and one of the, one of our, our children is also like this. And so we just want to stay up. We just want to like do stuff in the evening. And it could be anything. It could be art. It could be homework. It could be like, I feel motivated. Like, that book that I never want to read during the day because there's so many distractions suddenly at night is like, yes, I should be sleeping right now, but I want to dive into this amazing, amazing book. So how do you stay so organized? Like you run everything off a of Google calendar or mm -hmm. to-do list or what's your secret? Yeah, lots of, so uh, I have a really weird paper system. Have you seen those um, time management? It's like, it'll give you by the week and it'll also have by the day yeah. and then it'll have by the hour, et cetera. So I break it off into these immediate chunks. I have a large calendar that I work with that's based off my digital calendar, which people, you know, assign me things, right? They'll be like, we want this done and I'll say yes or no. And then I copy it to the paper one. So I get it down in my visual memory. And then I write, just, I just segment it out. And that's only when I feel pressure. I don't do it all the time. Like right now I'm on break. I was telling uh, Iona how bored I was. I'm going to be bored for like the next three weeks. I mean, boredom can be good sometimes, right? Sometimes, yeah. But, and that's why, like, the dragon thing is happening. That's why, like, it gives me space. So do you have trouble, like, not doing anything? Do you always have to be doing something? Yeah, I think so. There was, so I'm a um, level two iris meditation teacher, which is all about not doing things. I think that's kind of ironic. Um, but I really love the idea of being able to sit. One of the meditation retreats we do 
is you don't speak and you don't do anything. You don't paint, you don't fiddle with rocks, you don't read, you don't draw. You don't realize how hard that is not to do it's anything. So, it's, it's so hard, yeah. Yeah, it takes three days, I think, of like not doing anything. It's like torture for me. And then by the fourth day, I'm like, you know, you just feel so weird and different and connected to people in a different way. Hey, talk about, I think it's called the monkey mind. Hmm. I don't know. Tell me about it. It's like a, like, you, even if you're meditating, all these thoughts come in your mind. Yeah. And the monkey takes over your mind. Mm. Yeah. I don't know about the monkey mind. Okay. I know that um, there's, when I'm meditating, I'm really, I'm comfortable with it. So I can lock into like, I feel like I can lock in and let everything go very quickly. But there was a good year or two years where um, my brain was just firing off all the time. And you get to a point where you're sitting back and you're, you're watching all of this stuff happen and you're like, whoa, my brain never stops. And then slowly you kind of like distance yourself from it. And then it just slowly kind of becomes this, um, it's never like a purely quiet place, but it is like a muted place. Mm. All this stuff is going on, your brain, it almost seems like my brain is operating without me. And I'm just in the background, like observing, it, observing. So to speak. and then observing the observer and then observing that observer. And you're just and when you get into this like repetitive sinking back on who is the witness and who is witnessing the witness, that kind of mantra gets me into a state that is just really lovely. Um, I really like it. So when you're supervising people, because you've been in charge of direct reports, like mm -hmm. what, what does someone have to do for you to say, hey, you're not working out, you have to mm -hmm. go. What's like? What do they have, what have to have in that case? Yeah. What makes you like, let someone go? Um, I think that when you give people the opportunity, so as long as you're having clear communication with an individual about what your expectations are, um, I've been I've been led by people who've not had clear expectations and then been disappointed at me for not hitting marks. So I make sure that I, I state what end result I need. And if that person says, okay, I'll do it, and then doesn't do it, okay. So last time I gave you expectation, you said you would do it. You didn't do it. You tell me about it. We'll talk about it. Give them another opportunity. And I think that once you hit like a certain set of, and I don't know what that is. I think it's dependent on what your tolerance is for the individual. But if you're breaking my trust, like I, I think trust is important. I need to know that you on my team can deliver when I need you to deliver. That's part of project management. It's part of product management. And it's part of being on a team. You can't be a reliable team member. Nobody is going to let the person on the soccer field be a goalie mm -hmm. if, like, they never catch the ball. Yeah, you know, and they say they're going to do it next time. I got it next time, but then they're still sitting down and like. Yeah, I know in football they always say you know in the NFL they always say you know availability is the best thing you'd have, right? Mm -hmm. You be the best whatever it is, but if you're not available, what good are you, right? You have yeah. to be available and consistent, of course. Mm -hmm. I really love people who are, um, like, flexible. I there was, and it's I think one of the more difficult things to plan out. When you have an individual on your team who wants to do lots of different things, but you don't want to allocate a lot of power, right? Because that could be complicated because they could come up with a different strategy than what maybe your other members of the team have. And so, but I really appreciate it because I think that those are the individuals that are loyal and they're like here to, to get invested in everything. It's just an interesting team member experience. What, what's your take on, um, how do I put this? So let me backtrack. Let me ask you enough first. Are there any like interesting projects you're working on right now? What's that? Any interesting projects you're working on? Like any products specifically? Projects, yeah. Like yeah, do it for yourself or mm -hmm. someone else. Yeah. There's I'm really interested in natural language processing um, in the space of like gender neutral check. So um, there's kind of I recently went to Georgia for a bachelorette party. And um, when I was there, when here in Seattle, I'm used to everybody saying what our pronouns are and kind of having this exchange. And when I went to Georgia, like that didn't happen anywhere. And it kind of got me thinking about um, etiquette and how we can be more inclusive. Is that, is that inclusivity something we wanna do? So I started doing research, what the arguments are on both sides. Is it appropriate to be giving our pronouns? Is it not appropriate? Or is it, you know, what, what are the arguments are on all the perspectives? And I wanted to create, not something that said what we should do, but what if we could create um, just a, a simple app that, and I've started already building it where I can talk into it or I could upload a file and it can code for me what inclusive and exclusive language I'm using, not just like pronouns, but also maybe like mm, idioms or metaphors that we use that are actually quite systemically maybe racist or ableist or sexist. And to be able 
And ideally it would be people who are like this, I know I'm, I'm totally inclusive. And then they go and they do this thing and they're like, oh, maybe I'm not. And then, or maybe people like me who are like, I don't know, they just want to try it out. Or maybe even people who think the whole gender inclusive movement is wrong. They want to go challenge it and they go use it. And then they can see maybe how hurtful and how, like what, what the roots are, things that they're saying and what it represents. I think awareness is, I don't think anybody wants to be a bad guy. Nobody wants to come in and like hurt your feelings. People want to get along. It's a general experience I've had. So if you give people the tools to understand each other, then maybe we'll want to understand each other more. I don't know. So this is a, a small project. It's, a, it's working with Django and Python, and um, it's using an external library called um, Spacey. And it's, I think I want to learn more about how to actually train my own models because I haven't found a data set that works really well with what I need. So how do you keep from going crazy? Your brain just busting with all this knowledge you have, like these projects, all you doing this, you're doing that. Like, how do you yeah. like keep organized? You just got to keep making stuff, yeah. I think. And I think that you set yourself up by having a GitHub, right? Being able to have these small projects, but again, pivoting, I think having so many things that I'm not committed to long-term, I don't have like any deadlines and that's the, the luxury and the privilege of being a student. I, I don't have anything due tomorrow. I can play however I need to play. If I need like satisfaction and getting something done, I could go level my character up or I could go finish a pillow, you know, or I could go do some craft. Um, I think the art piece specifically is what balances me out. I don't know what other people do. So what's your take on this? I think some people would say like developers, they're always like building stuff, right? On mm -hmm. GitHub, build different things, but they never finish anything, right? They'll go from project <laughs> to project. There'll be a real nice project. They'll work for a while, get to point. They'll jump something else, like they build, 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 but do they ever actually finish something and you complete anything? I mean, I would, I would say that users are always changing. So your product is never finished, even when you think it is. That's I, a good point. But the, I mean, so my, uh, my partner's an engineer and he is always building crazy things around our apartment, like things that will like just, just interesting solutions, things I would never think of. He is, is an inventor at heart. And he's always tinkering and there is always something laid somewhere where some project is in mid, mid flight, you know? And I think that that's, I think that's part of our brain. I think we just like, at least individuals who are geared towards problem solving. I think we like to be able to solve and solve and solve. And then we need to step away from it to do like diffuse thinking. We need to go get different solutions, different perspectives, and then circle back to it eventually. Hopefully people circle back. I, I would feel sad if I didn't finish. What advice you have for either women already in tech or women mm. trying to get into tech? Mm. Getting into tech? I think that being able to network with all kinds of different groups is important. Um, there are women who code, there's women tech ambassadors. These are important resources to have. Um, I cried the first time I went to a women conference because they were talking about experiences that I had had in the workplace. And I just felt, I just didn't know that other people also had it and that it was a thing. So I think that's important to have as support, but I think it's also important to go to conferences and to go and meet, do meetups. Um, don't join. I, I, we can't say this, right. I've been told not to say this and not to have this attitude. I don't want to join a team of all men I, or all one type or all one demographic. I, I want to join diverse teams because I, I don't like that experience. I'm not well equipped enough to go into a room. Um, and help shape a culture to be more inclusive from, the, from that level, you know? I, I think that there are women out there who are very strong and capable of doing that from an engineering role, but not, not me, not right now. So let's talk about this. You know, everyone says I want to do diverse hiring, yeah. but I don't think they admit or recognize how tough diverse hiring is, right? You just gotta say, I'm gonna hire this demographic, right? Yeah. First of all, they have to be qualified. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to, you have to convince them to come and work for you, right? You have to find them. You have to find them. Or do they really want to work for you? Right. So you just have to say, oh, I need a Hispanic female. Go mm -hmm. find me a Hispanic female or whatever the case may be, right? Right. It's, I think people underestimate how hard it is, right? I mm -hmm. mean, you have to convince them to work for you. And like you said, mm -hmm. if, you know, are you going to work for a company with like 10 white females or 10 Hispanic, whatever, or, you know, six, whatever the case may be? Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. so you're off the table, right? Mm-hmm. It's, 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 people, don't, people don't recognize how tough it is. One thing that I saw happen um, was uh, recruiters or CEOs or anybody on the team who's hiring, they would talk to their friends 
and their friends would be the same demographic as them. Yeah. And then they don't have friends from other demographics. Yeah. And I think that's, you can't hire that way. You have so to. So many people do. Yeah. Like maybe, I don't know how expensive it is, but when you go to like a career convention, you know, those conventions where there are a lot of different employers, maybe that's a way to diversify and shake up the pool. I just know that um, you'll meet people who, whose friends are like them. That's, and if you're just hiring out of that and then you say, I can't find anybody, you're not really trying. Like I know there's a lot of VCs who will say, you know, I want to invest in like, you know, you know diverse things, right? Mm -hmm. But then they'll say, I only meet people who I'm introduced to by my own network, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are you hearing yourself? Yeah. Like, you're saying one thing, but you're doing another thing, right? Well, again, yeah, like we all don't want to be villains. And I think we all, I would love to think that my network is diverse, but it, it might not be. Mm -hmm. And I think being able to use that philosophical mindset of like, wait, am I really doing what I say I'm doing right yeah. now um, is really important. I, I have no solution for how to convince because I, it hasn't worked. I think when you tell people you're not being diverse, they don't want to hear that. Yeah. They don't, I don't think that's welcoming. How do you convince um, people in power that maybe they need to reevaluate? And diversity means so many things, right? You know, you might have a team with 10 people with like, three whites, two blacks, on and on and on, but you don't have a, we'll say, a Native American on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you're not diverse, or you might- Or you don't have diverse backgrounds. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not easy, I don't think, you know. But your product is gonna benefit from it. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, and I think that if I, if, and that's, I think, the angle that I'm trying to take by going back to school and making sure that I understand all of these like hard principles, how can I turn ethics into profit? I don't, I mean, a lot of, I have a lot of respect for um, NGOs and um, not-for-profit, just the whole realm is gorgeous, but I sometimes wonder if for-profit industry could be interested in ethics, like, and that's the driving force, right, in the market. So I think that would be amazing. Oh, it kills me, like, you have a company that's like, man, we need to increase sales to, like, you know, this demographic, but the demographic doesn't work for them, right? Yeah. Like, how are you going to know what the demographic works if, no, if, if there's no one on your team uh -huh. who can talk about it? I was just uh, reading a book called Design Justice, listening to the audio book, actually, because in my car, who has time to read? And the, um, the book was talking about the invent the toilet thing. Do you remember this? The, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation had started a build or reinvent the toilet kind of design challenge a couple of years ago. Billions of dollars get put into this thing. The winning teams hadn't actually gone to these places where the toilets were going to be installed and they need and the toilets had absurd constraints like it needs to get rid of all the bacteria and it needs to be a technology that everybody's going to want to use all across the globe and it like had all these design constraints it has to be like five cents per user over its lifetime all these things that just sound really difficult and the users created the people who won created the toilet that you would sit on, but in it's squatting is a more appropriate way, right? They hadn't thought about these things and they hadn't actually gone and asked the actual users who were going to be using it. That blows my brain. Like, how are you, how are you going to design something and only, only test college students or only test people who just have no input on what the product should be doing. And they had, I'm guessing they had the money to travel to different places, right? Oh yeah. And they did, they took field trips. They took field trips to the area and they had like looked at, and they had kind of as an afterthought, um, talked to different vendors in the area because they realized at the end, we should probably make the manufacturing something that could be local. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. I think that that would have been like fundamental thing going in. Like it can't be something that is involved in this like high trade network. It has to be something that could be local to support systemic growth and to support the local community. I think that that's where, that's like the design aspect. That's like the kind of thinking that I would love to see enter into product design and tech design. So I almost forgot to ask you about something. What? But Doctor Who. Yeah, Doctor Who. What is Doctor Who? You don't, really? I think I know what it is, okay. but I just want to make sure. It's, it's a show. It's the longest running show, I think, in history. I mean, it's, it's been on television since. TV was black and white. And the doctor is an alien. He has, he's from Gallifrey. <laughs> he has two hearts and he, it's not always a he, he, uh, when he dies, he regenerates into a new actor or a new, a new doctor. And, and it's just wildly fun. It's goofy. It's silly. Sometimes it's not 
good. And it's still on TV. And it's still on TV. And sometimes it is good. Sometimes it's it's so bad it's good, you know? I know what you're saying, yeah. Like, yeah. like your joke's so corny, you got to laugh at it. And there are themes that have been running like through the course of this TV show. Like <laughs> there's these things called the Cybermen. There are the Daleks who want to exterminate hum- everything, not just humans. There And he travels the universe in this little blue box. It's called the TARDIS. And the TARDIS is bigger on the inside. And so when people see it, they go into this little police box and then they're like, oh, and every single one of them eventually says it's so much bigger on the inside. And it's just this, there's just so many inside jokes. Um, And the doctor is like, it's like a maniacal Sherlock Holmes character. And I love those people, the kind of people who walk into a room and are just like, they're not paying attention to the social immediate dynamics of the room. They're like seeing the whole picture and being childlike, enthusiastic, and excited about it. There's one episode that I think is amazing. It's like, are you familiar with the myth of Sisyphus? No. no. The myth of Sisyphus is, um, I, I won't describe the whole thing, but it's the the pushing the stone up to the top of the hill. Okay, I am. Yeah. Okay, I know what it is. Yeah. So there was an episode of The Doctor like that. And um, so The Doctor manifests in this room. You think it's for the first time. And he is being chased by this phantom throughout this whole castle. And he ends up realizing that he's been here. He's been here a billion times before. And then as he's solving this puddle, he gets puzzled. He gets to the last room and he sees this wall of diamond in front of him. And he realizes in that moment, before I get eaten by this phantom, I need to be eaten by the phantom, one. And two, I need to punch this diamond wall as many times as I can before I die. So he's like punching it three times. Billions and billions of years pass of him doing this one after another. And I love it because I think he finally escapes from this prison. Um, And when he gets to the person, he says to them, like, let that person know, like, I took the long way around. And I really feel like it's the perfect metaphor for iterative, beautiful, methodical escape from the regimes and the design processes that we currently have. You just have to sacrifice and keep going like little bitty bits at a time. Yeah, hopefully you can do it in less than a billion years, though, right? I know. Yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> maybe maybe only a million years. Yeah, but maybe like maybe it just takes one voice, and that's all I can. I think that's like a part of appreciating what you bring to the table. I might not solve something gigantic someday, even though I'd love to. But being a part of it is important. Sometimes you'll uh, people use the excuse like I I'm not going to vote because it doesn't count, mm. kind of thing. And I think that's an easy easy argument to fall into. I've fallen into it myself. If, if what I do doesn't matter, why am I doing it? But I think that the small things that we do collectively can, can make a change. We could be that tipping point in any realm, mm-hmm. like, you know, in voting or in a voice for ethics and tech. So my responsibility then is to represent myself and, you know, maybe be that tipping point or maybe inspire someone else to be a tipping point. So earlier I asked you about, you know, what you're excited about future in tech. Mm-hmm. So this is a question for you. Talk about something that you think is going to happen, like hasn't happened yet, right? So example, I watched this, I used to watch this show called Your Million on, uh, I think it was an National Geographic. Yeah. And talk about stuff going to happen like a million years from now. Like, it's like, talk about one thing that I'm about, they're going to be like, a, you're going to get a shot of nanobots hmm. and the nanobots are going to cure any disease. So if you have cancer, it's going to destroy cancer. Yeah. And talk about you know, up, you know, uplifting your consciousness and the robots to have virtual life, all that kind of stuff, just mm-hmm. off the wall stuff, traveling and stuff. Yeah. What do you think some off the wall futuristic stuff? Sure. Did you ever, uh, did you ever read Alex? Uh, Huxley's Brave New World. I think I did. It sounds familiar. Yeah, I did a long time ago, but I, I will never forget um, The Feelies, which was the movie experience. I'm mean, kind of have this now a little bit, but it was a movie experience where you sat down in the chair and you felt everything. So it wasn't just VR. It was like a sensorial experience. I think that neurobiology will tap into all the processes that our sense organs kind of take in to create this reality and this consciousness. And I think if we can biohack that and create technology that simulates, um, whether that be the voices that we hear in the head, whether that be um, the feeling of someone holding my hand, I think that that would be, could you imagine like what that would feel like? I mean, there are all kinds of interesting implications, but I mean, just for people who maybe need exposure therapy to being hugged, you know, there's all kinds of applications in that space. We just need to do research to tap into yeah, you remember one thing was they all had to telepathy, mm. which of course is actually a bad thing, right? Because whatever you thought, everyone knew what it was, right? Yeah, it was like kind of crazy, right? What do you what do you say? You know, you you think it let me for real? Mm. 
I think that they had the, didn't they just recently, uh, it was somebody who's locked in, right? They had, um, uh, I can't remember what the disease is, it Parkinson's, it, where they're like locked into their bodies. They can't move. All they can do is move their eyes. And they had found a way to um, translate what the individual was saying based off eye movement. Um, I remember hearing that. Note. Yeah. But the person who had done it had been debunked because they had not had the best research mm -hmm. methodologies. Um, but that's interesting. So next question. Mm -hmm. Would you want to go 500 years in the future or 500 years in the past? Mm -hmm. Do I get to retain everything I have if I go in the past? Yeah. I think I, I think I would want to go in the past first because we have these narratives about our past. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, childhood. You'll be what you'll watch maybe uh, TV shows about medieval times, and you'll see a kid playing with a horse or something. I don't think I don't think childhood was a thing. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the narratives that I've been told about these constructs we have today were not the case. No. Five hundred years ago. So I would love to have that perspective. Like, what was it then? But five hundred years ago, it's all the diseases. There's no technology. I mean, like, maybe that's a different. Maybe they have like a different different idioms that they use maybe there's like a different philosophy about how you navigate or interact with one another which would be so difficult for us to see right now through even through like a lens of a hundred you even like documentaries of the past century that are trying to tell us what it was we wouldn't really know like going to rome wouldn't that like, be rome, yeah i would love to do that like, roman, yes. roman empire it probably took like two weeks to get a message from rome like somewhere else right yeah and i was like instantly and what do you do that whole time yeah i mean we, I'm, I'm roman soldier i gotta travel for two weeks on my horse to deliver this message through enemy territory. I'll be back later. Yeah. Your life is no, like, imagine all the emails that we answer, right? Like you and I are communicating mm -hmm. almost instantly yep. via email. What if that took two weeks yeah. to orchestrate? And, you know, a king sends a message, hey, I want to make peace. <laughs> and then the message doesn't oh, no. get there and something else happens. Oh, I guess mm -hmm. I doesn't want peace. Let's go to war, you know? Yeah. I was just watching uh, last night. We landed on um, the movie Emma. This is like a Jane Austen um, rendition of Emma. And it was um, really interesting to see these like social, this old story with all these like social complexities. And it, they're funny where people, humans, it's like Shakespeare, right? There's always been this like human element of confusion and timeliness um, and how they kind of orchestrate, but how they still apply to today. I think those things are still applicable, but. Uh, so if you go back 500 years in the past, you know, it's like no tech, you know, mm -hmm. The diseases, you know, okay. different people. Mm -hmm. Then you go five years in the future. What the war doesn't exist, right? Like five yeah. years in the future, like there's some kind of you no know, mad X, you know. What if stuff. it's the same? What if there's no technology then? Yeah. Right. I think that, and I think that's what scares me about going into the future. I would go, and there's what am I? Gonna, I'm not going to be able to change. What if, what if everyone's like living in caves because you can't breathe yeah. the air? You know. <gasps> Or what if everyone? What if you know Elon Musk was successful? We moved everyone to Mars, right? You're mm -hmm. here like by yourself, like yeah, like do, what do, do. <laughs> there? Um, that's why I kind of like Doctor Who, because Doctor Who travels through time and space. So he travels, uh, or they travel uh, into the future or into the past mm -hmm. or into different planets, right? And sometimes the human companions he has, which change, uh, they'll be in the future and they'll be like, "What happened?" And you can tell. I mean, the the directors and the producers want them to have like a visceral like. I feel lost. I feel grief. What happened to the human race? These kind of questions. Um, and I think that would be really existentially difficult to grapple with. Um, yeah. What if it was bad? Do you think there's an intelligent life out there somewhere? Because it's been yeah. proven, to, it's been proven there's life out there. Of course, life can be like a microcosm, right? Yeah. Do you think there's intelligent life out I there? I think there's intelligent life here. I think that um, we just don't always acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that just like our brains kind of operate differently. I think different species have um, different, oh my gosh, whales. Can I talk to you about yeah, whales? Yeah, please. Whales have, they do like these emotional emails to each other. And they, so- I heard dolphins do the same thing, I think. Gosh, I am so in love with this concept. Like, so if you and I are in a pack with this water bottle and this water bottle feels sad, this water bottle comes into our pack and like sends this emotional, like I am sad. Then you and I also are sad. And we send back like, well, I'm actually kind of content right now. And you're like, well, I'm ecstatic. The complicated emotional expression that we're sharing as a group, back to that slime mold mentality, like 
you can all communicate these emotional complexities and make decisions as a group. I think there's something really beautiful there that we don't tap into, but maybe we could if we understood or had different systemic societal constructs in place. Do you know who Lex Friedman is? Uh, no. So he has this podcast. He's like this big time AI data scientist guy has a podcast. I think I've, yeah. He has like a, he always wears a suit, you mm-hmm. know, like, like super smart. I just started listening to the podcast like today. Yeah, he's very good. And so um, he, they were talking, he was talking to someone about alien life mm. and who like, and his thing was like, the human race is like too um, overcome. I can't think of what he's like. Why do we think they would contact us, right? Maybe mm-hmm. they contact the ants or the dolphins. And the guys are like, well, we have other buildings and stuff, or maybe not based on buildings. Maybe, you know, mm-hmm. they communicate with like dolphins or something else, right? Maybe they see us like the, you know, the scourge of the earth, right? Yeah. You know? Or like maybe they've already been here, or maybe they just were like uninterested. Maybe I, I think, I don't, I think that there's like a lot of anthropomorphizing mm-hmm. that we do on what intelligent life could be. We imagine we, when we say intelligent life, for instance, um, I think initially when we were talking about the Turing test, right? Um, could a computer just be enough like a human? And that would pass the test. Um, is having a sense of humor make us human? Like what, what makes us human yeah. exactly compared to like a machine emulating it or alien life? And so I just think it's um, when you boil it down, it's really difficult to pinpoint what makes us us. And when we're trying to like map that onto a universe of endless possibilities. Yeah, because people are like, you know, aliens gonna look like this stereotypical alien. It might look like octopus, might be a yeah. snake, it might be whatever, you know? What if it was like discombobulated and had like, was multiple creatures, right? Yeah. Not connected. Or it was just like a conscious, just thoughts. Yeah, what if it, so there was a Doctor Who episode, I'm telling you everything. There's a Doctor Who episode that had a conscious universe and it could take the shape of whatever it wanted and it took the shape of a frog. Um, very Douglas Adams when I think about it, you know. I mean, I think every day they're discovering thousands and thousands more plants, more universes, you yeah. know, like, is there edge? Is it like a globe? It's like, right. and like Mars is like so far away, but it's not, you know, in the big scheme of things. Mm-hmm. I was just, I was like, I guess I was listening to shortwave or maybe it was stuff you should know about Venus. I can't remember, but um, Venus was just like us. And there are a lot of planets out there that are just like us. I mean, Mars is, but now Mars have oceans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then I watched this thing on National Geographic a while ago where they launched some kind of satellite to Pluto. It launched like 2003. You didn't get to like 2012, you know, nine years later, yeah. right? Like, man, it's insane. How is, I, like, it's hard to hold enthusiasm for that over long term. Yeah. You know? And like, what happened is like, you know, you're lead, lead engineer on the, on the it's Friday, right? Yeah. And you retire in 2007. In 2012, it fails, it blows up. They come back and take your money from you, take away your pension. Like, what do they do, oh. right? Like, like you failed, right? Hey, yeah. and then you failed, right? You're done. Mm. That'd be really bad this whole life. Like you feel really good about what you've accomplished and then come to find out you like. You made this one yeah. mathematical error. Yeah, oops. One thing I found issue, I had no idea. So like the Mars Rover, mm-hmm. you, I always thought, you know, it's like scientists build it, whatever. But actually like this regular craftsman builder, right? The science type what you do is like regular auto people build it, right? Of course they go through tests, you know, have to build a curriculum, but it's like have high school diplomas, GEDs, trade schools. And they're building like this multi-billion dollar product right yeah. and i never thought about it. i thought it was like scientists doing it, right like people do no it's like they're just re- not, of course we're all regular people like just sure, yeah. screwdrivers and drills but you envision like high tech yeah then yeah maybe it is high tech i think like somebody with like, mit degree you know yeah. but yeah, yeah he's like yeah i got a gd i got this mm-hmm. i mean you know i've been doing this i've been working for nasa 10 years you know i built this i built that you know of course mm-hmm. i'll be precise and you know all the kind of stuff you know yeah. and clean environment but I, I just blew my mind like damn yeah. can you imagine how could that be like going like you know to, to your great. home yeah like what do you do oh i build nasa no big right. yeah yeah like that would be great to tell grandma at christmas you know what'd you do this year huh. well you see that up there that's, that's all me <laughs> i did that i was just thinking about how um i was listening to something about they had determined that the beginnings of life sometimes people think it had to be like this perfect environment right and this this soup but they found that there are certain proteins when on basalmic glass that's not basalmic what is it it I'm not a geologist, but it's a type of like, I want to say it's like lava, like a type of glass that's created from volcanic activity. Somebody will probably correct me. Um, but that's, it's like creates this, this little perfect situation where proteins can fold themselves in just the right way to make kind of the foundations, the, the basic proteins, maybe not RNA or DNA, but I thought that was really neat. I think it's like really cool that people focus on this and then emulating those insights into technology, right? How can I 
how can I mimic life? And it's, I think that's bioengineering. There are so many bioengineers in the engineering school at UW. You run into them and they are passionate about what they're doing. It's cool. I think people don't realize like there's all these worlds, right? There's worlds of physics, the world of math, mm -hmm. the worlds of science, all different worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of in the in the trying, so to speak, right? Very, very interesting. That is. You can go anywhere. What what's your thoughts on um space travel? Mm. You get an email. We look for hundred volunteers to go to Mars. Yeah, I'd go. I'd go just for the I think the experience. Yeah. I have always been the kind of person that someone says, hey, this like weird experience is coming up. We have no idea how it's going to go. I'm like, yeah, like, like sign me up. Like, why yeah. not? Um, of course, like not factoring in children and these sorts yeah. of things. Right? You kids but, have, your kids have to be grown, right? Yeah, we're all, we're all going to go on this really risky mission. Um, but I think personally, I, I like, I'm a little disheartened about it. I feel like space travel, like. To me, it should have happened by now, right? Right. Like. When someone like six nine, so I had an interview with this guy named Miguel Miguel Yal, his idea, his startup. They're, they're like sending like, send, like most NASA and SpaceX, they send these big yeah. ass satellites. Yeah. His company sends like really small satellites, right? Yeah. And I knew this, but I didn't. But like, of course, um, most people don't realize this, but there's more power on this than the, the programming to, to send the moon in 1969. Wow. And he also told me like all the tech for space rockets now, all the tech is still 1970s tech. Nothing's been advanced, right? And there's so many missed opportunities, like nothing was done to the 70s, 80s, you know, yeah. has a space shuttle, don't want the moon, like all this lots of opportunity, right? To me, mm -hmm. we should have done been on Mars, right? Yeah. It feels like there's, it's like a, mm, like a, like it takes too long or there's, I can't quite put my finger on it, but it just feels like we're not, like we missed it. Uh, like we're like already, we have the opportunity, right? We have real momentum. Yeah. Beat the rest of the space race, sending people to the moon, mm -hmm. doing this great stuff, you know? And then we stop. Like just stop. That's like, okay, stop. Like, what are we doing right? I think always got to be pushing forward. I think you know, it's like what well, we also are living on the fumes and dreams of like sci-fi, mm -hmm. beautiful these shows that like Star Wars. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. So in my brain, I'm like, look, we're not we're not in hyperdrive going to yeah, like, know, other right? galaxies. Yeah. What are we doing? Uh, so my expectations are a little high, but I wouldn't it be that would be like the revelation of a lifetime to to hear that we could suddenly do that. Yeah. I'm like, what would we do? Yeah, like, you know, we're not going to go to Mars and have like a rock walking party for us, right? Right. Finally, humans, you're here. Finally, Earthlings, you're here. We've been, we been waiting for you. Right. Took long enough, friends. Yeah, I, I just, I sometimes, I also kind of fall into that like existential, like it's all rocks, yeah. you know? And I mean, I, I own a lot of respect for all those rocks and I recognize that there's a whole industry space on exploring that, but rocks don't always excite me. Um, yeah. and maybe it'll tell us about our universe, but like, what do we use that for? Yeah. I mean, do we, does it, yeah. What, what do we really care? Or what do we get out of like, find out how the earth was formed, right? Yeah. How does it affect the day-to-day -day life of everyone, right? And sometimes it can, sometimes technology or is informed by those kind of things. Um, and I just don't, I'm, I'm curious. I'm open to hearing how all of that's going to help us live better lives. Yeah. yeah. But like, you bring a point, good point. So many people use tech, have an idea it works, what's it for, you know, this, oh, here's my phone. Mm -hmm. Or they were like, um, I'm going to watch this TV show, this comedian made a joke, he was on the airplane, and the guy next to was like, cussing out, God damn it, my, my internet doesn't work. He was like, dude, can you give us a second to come from space? Can you be patient one or two seconds? It's going to space, coming back, just calm down, your internet will work, right? Yeah. Oh. There was um, a really cool book, actually, I have it. It's um, called Switch, or no, uh, Swipe to Unlock. And I really wish I had found it when I had just started kind of learning about building websites and technology because I came from nothing. I had no idea any of it. And this book, it's for uh, people who are interested in product management so they can like kind of scale up and get like the high level of all these different tech. And it is a great primer. It covers Facebook algorithms. It covers how does Google search work? It covered um, cloud computing. So like AWS and how, and like the business side of all of that. Highly recommend that for anybody that's interested in like, if, if the concept of coding and, and tech seems like a really big wall, this book is really good to just peruse through. Cause people don't realize you don't have to be a genius to learn how to code, right? It's, no. it's not, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, right? It's, it's, my kids learn it's like repetitive and only the like by tech, anyone from six to 99 can learn it. Mm -hmm. You just have to know the mental model for mm -hmm. it. And that's, sometimes that's the difficult part. If you grow up in a space where you're not 
you don't have a mental model that you can, you know, appropriately create the metaphors to understand the concept, you're going to fail. This is why clean code is important. This is why building and explaining technology in a, you know, way that is communicable to other people is key to being able to um, hire people and train people. So this is a guy I follow on YouTube, right? Every once in a while, I'm subscribed to this channel. Mm -hmm. This guy, 75 years old, he learned Python at 70. So every week he does like new Python experiment. For like five years, yeah. he does a new Python experiment. Like, yeah, it's, it's so cool, right? That the stuff you build, the stuff you know, like, yeah. Yeah. My, uh, I have an aunt. She is 80. Her name is Jenny Aldridge Walker. And uh, she's like my maternal figure. When she, this woman, she like skydived at 70. She was all about like learning. She's an actress. She's writing plays. She is constantly, she's more involved in things than I am at 80 years old, right? And I just think that kind of drive, that kind of openness. I think she got, she got a degree when she was 65 because that's when it's free. You can go back to school for free after like a certain age in at least Florida. Yes. What like a wonderful mentality. And it kind of like ties into this lifetime learning thing. Like when you hit 30 and maybe you have a degree, you're not done. Yeah. You should, and, it, and you shouldn't just be going to like, I went to this course, like this is huge anything. I got to keep learning. I feel like stepping back, taking a sabbatical, like, advocating for yourself. Like I need to go. I knew somebody that went to Australia once for six months, told their employer, like, you want me to stick around? I need to go do this. I need to go research these things. And the employer was like, all right. And I think that we need that. It helps our brains. It helps us become better humans. Yeah. One thing I try to do, I don't do it as enough. Like I try my best, like the once a week, like, you know, I always say, you know, just in a podcast and all this extra external stimuli. Mm -hmm. I try once a week, like for at least 30 minutes, like have nothing on. That's like empty brain, right? Yeah. Because even these all my time ideas coming through, creativity, nothing, just thoughts come in, you know? Yeah. We do walking. Every day at four o'clock, we walk on, we live next to a school. And we walk around their, um, their little, their, what do you call it? The track. Yeah. They have like that rubber for track and field. And it's awesome. Cause we're together. So we're not really like on our phones mm. and we're not listening to anything cause we're together. Mm. We have our dog and we're just walking around and we we're quiet cause we're comfortable with our quiet, but sometimes things come up and you're like, I want to talk about this or I want to explore this idea. It's a really great way to connect. It's a really great way to like promote diffuse thinking. Um, love it. Love walking. Um, I might've asked you before, but I don't think I did. <laughs> What's some, um, that actually what, what kind of future tech you're, you're interested in? Yeah. So what I what I what future tech I want is like, you know, the matrix where you put the thing in you. <laughs> that'd be so cool, right? You think that would, that would hurt so much. It would, but man, all the stuff you'll learn. Like I want to learn yeah. how to code instantly. Just download it. I want to learn how to box. I want to learn, you know, whatever. I want to learn how to fly a, a I want to be able to a nuclear whatever, right? Ooh, so mm, just, right now you have the ability to go online and I'm and I'm gonna use it as a metaphor. Okay. Like you can go online and you can buy almost anything. Yeah, you can, yeah. You have that feeling where like, I'm going to buy this thing and it's, it's going to be a part of my identity and I'm going to change, right? So you go and you buy the thing and it arrives and you're like, this is so cool. Yeah. I feel like that's what that would do. I feel like I would be like, it's, I'm going to learn this, 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 this. But then it's so easy and accessible. Yeah. Just and, like, you know, like how many people that live in Seattle go to the space field, right? Right. Like how many people live in New York City go to the Empire State Building, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Part of no one, right? Like maybe I would like, I'm going to be a master knitter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then I'm like, well, done, but I never knit. Yeah, I, that's a good point. Yeah, but I, what would be your first tech that you would, or the first thing that you would learn? Oh man, tech? probably how to code. You don't know how to code? Yeah. Oh. Probably how to code, yeah. You can learn how to code. You can totally do it. Yeah, but one second versus, yeah. you know. Yeah. There's a lot of things like, you know, I, I would love to play guitar, how to mm. draw, paint, you know, yeah. just a lot of stuff, you know. That would be an interesting, like, how would that work? Because the music, the, what you learn in, in music is um, kind of how to read the music or how to just translate the music into being in an instrument. And then it's muscle memory yeah. of how to play it over and over again, like the two parts to it. And then you let go and it just does it on its own. So how, how could we convince the muscle to have that memory? Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Another interest too, like you know how many people like make or make themselves successful just for like muscle memory, like doing it over and over again. Like mm. I follow a young lady on on TikTok and Instagram. I think her name is Buddha Tiger, right? Mm. She's a female guitarist, been playing guitar since like seven years old. Um, 
she's like 25, 26 now. She's been a tour of the world. She's been on Saturday Night Live. There's all these different things, right? What am I? And she's been playing guitar at seven years old. So like she, she, she says, like, I've always known I'm going to make guitar play seven years old. And she's living her life, right? She's oh. like traveling. Um, she's been a guest guitarist, like some big time bands. Yeah, she's just only 24 years old, right? My, uh, my youngest. He's a, it's, it's scary for us as parents. He just recently told me he, um, when he was younger, he wanted to be the Costco, the person that hands out samples mm -hmm. at Costco because he just thinks there's magic there. Yeah. And then it be, slowly became like, I want to be a chef and I want to be an artist. And I thought like when he first said these things, but he keeps saying it and he keeps making things. And well, it was like, true. Like a lot of like successful people, they knew what they wanted for a long time, right? Like mm -hmm. Kobe Bryant, he knew he wanted to be a best player at the age of six, right? That's beautiful. You know, yeah. Michael Jackson knew he wanted to be a singer. Like a lot of like, we'll say like, you know, geniuses or savants, like really, really good people. Mm -hmm. They knew from a long time, you know, what's the rule that Markham Gal called Gladwell sell 10,000 hours or, yeah. you know, find, hone your craft, or whatever. I think it's true to that, you know? Mm -hmm. Speaking to that, there's, um, there was an individual uh, who recently sent me, because we were talking about how we wanted to design a website and, and for the computer science club. And what did, what, who were we serving and what did they need? And one of the individuals said, you know, there's this myth that you discover what it is you're good at. And that's like, it stops people because it could be, and this is a fair truth, you might not be good at anything. Mm -hmm. You might be good at maybe like a fundamental thing. Like maybe I'm really good at thinking, overthinking what I'm doing. And that translates into problem solving, right? Or being reflective. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the idea, you're just waiting around with your hands in your pocket, like, I'm going to discover it someday. But when you, what you really should be doing is that you're working towards. Something. Yeah. You should be experimenting. Yeah. Like doing different things mm -hmm. and like keeping at it. So even like you might be dabbling in all these things and you might be like, I'm not good at any of these things. Just pick one, pick one and just do it. I like, well, like, so, so I can't think of the name, but back in the, like the Renaissance, there's like the two famous musicians, like two mm -hmm. composers, the, the husband and wife, great composers mm -hmm. and the kids became great composers. So is it because their talent, the mm -hmm. environment, you know, got to be the environment maybe yeah. a mixture maybe yeah a mixture. because there's there's um my son is really talented with music and i also felt very inclined towards music when i was younger i mean i didn't do anything with mm -hmm. it other than like self-soothing yeah but i noticed the same the same like mental approach to instruments you know you see these things in your kids yeah. and they're always different like the the chef mm -hmm. the chef doesn't have a musical inclination yeah. at all so where do they get them from you know yeah, mm -hmm. this is yeah, this is funny. Like, and like you, you might be the greatest guitar player ever, mm -hmm. but you never seen a guitar. Like, you just don't know, right? Yeah, just experiment. But if you again, that's like part of discovering. Like, you wouldn't just be amazing. You would need to work at it. And so, with the thought that I'm not, I like coming from a space of I'm, I'm not good at anything. I'm not good at coding. I'm not good at any of it. And then that kind of sets you free. I'm not waiting to discover anything. I can just decide. I'm going to start opening jars and I'm going to be really good at opening mm -hmm. jars by the time I'm 90. Yeah. I'll be an expert. I'll be the best in the world at opening jars. And I think it's, it's just having like that dedication and that, that slow build. And that's another good piece of advice for anybody who wants to get into tech because people might think I don't, I'm not good at configuring my email. I would be horrible at tech. I hear that all the time. I oh, toward them terrible with tech. I, I know nothing about it. Uh, well, you just need to like, do a thing mm -hmm. and then the next day do another thing i don't know everything about tech i've met seniors like senior engineers who don't know how to do things they google as much as i do about any topic so i think i think it's just about letting go of this idea of finding your perfect thing and just inching through the world and be good at it eventually you know yeah but some people i think are natural stuff like my son right mm. um like if you were saying today like if, if you could like if you like there's no nothing on, on that label right no ingredients whatever yeah he could taste it and tell exactly what the ingredients were right nice ability like he'll like one time we visited my cousin in san antonio and mm -hmm. he said hey can you taste this he tasted it he said it needs this it was something off the wall right like mm -hmm. something like you never put a spaghetti sauce right mm -hmm. are you sure he said this try it was like that like, freaking perfect right <laughs> yeah he always had the talent he would be good at wine tasting just like a whole thing in that world they get the i had a friend who I can't think of what the name is right now. You go through a school and you get a ring or something. Mm. And then you can like be a wine sauce if you want. But you have to know like the, you taste the dirt, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you have to like know like, oh, I can I can tell that there's this is off the banks of so and so, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's crazy. 
Anything? So Renee, is there anything I sort of asked you that I haven't, or anything else you want to talk about? No, I had um, a really good conversation. I think it just feels natural. Yeah, for those who don't know, I thought Renee had been like a dozens and dozens of podcasts, yeah. but this is actually her very first podcast. Yeah. So I thought I don't know why I thought you were like dozens of them before. That's okay. I mean, with all the events, uh, I think that there's we we do we spend a lot of time talking with people mm -hmm. online, and I do a lot of maybe public speaking, but never a podcast. Yeah, hope you had enjoyed your experience. I have. It's been fun. It's a lot of fun, ain't it? Yeah. Cool. Um, can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Uh, sure. Um, on LinkedIn, I think it's, you know, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Amanda Renee Capella. And my Twitter handle is Renee Capella. On Reddit, you can find me as Renee Capella. I like bear my full name everywhere. I have no shame. And to our listeners, we have our social media on the, on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetstatesoverlaw.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and your network. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and view the Jason Cabinet's experience. So let's talk about Reddit real fast. Yeah. So Reddit, like, are you all, are you all there a lot? Uh, I'll say I'm on certain certain pieces of Reddit. Like, yeah. I've never really been on. I just I just hear the stuff right. Like Reddit's like a, another yeah. cesspool. Like there's all these sub communities, like these mm. dark places, and like yeah. you know evilness, and like oh don't go there don't go. if you're not mentally strong because you're gonna get embarrassed and torn down and mm -hmm. all the kind of stuff. Is yeah. it really that bad? Or is it, like it can be. <laughs> you need to be. I think like with anything, you need to know what neighborhood you're going into. Mm. And so you're saying you probably don't want to go in South South Chicago at three in the morning, right? Probably not. But I would go into, so I really love the book, uh, The King Killer Chronicles, The Name of the Wind and Wise Man's Fear by Patrick Rothfuss. The third Doors of Stone is, is going to come out in the future. But I visit that subreddit all the time to talk about theories because the, it's an amazing book. Um, sometime I'll send you a link for it. But how, it's How about Cora? Do you own Cora any? No. Mm -mm. So he's a Reddit red person? Yeah, Reddit. Just read it. I mean, sometimes I go on Quora. I think I've answered one question about mm -hmm. co coffee, like mm -hmm. caffeine withdrawal that had some like likes, like 36 people have been like, yes, this is really helpful. But I've, I've never felt inclined to answer more questions or so you know, you're more active on Reddit. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I've even stopped that really. Yeah. Yeah. What other social media do you like to be on? What's your like uh, LinkedIn? LinkedIn is the one. But mainly because um, I think that you could find amazing people on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and then you can start really interesting conversations. But generally, I don't do social media yeah. because I don't, I don't, I get sucked in, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel it. I mean, I lose, it feels like I don't have control. And so, like, I don't do Facebook. My family is on there. So yeah. I, I try to catch up occasionally. But really, I think. Yeah, I haven't posted on Facebook for a while. I'll still do once a day to see what's going on, but I haven't yeah. posted there for a while. Right. And I, like, I remember when we were doing our Google Developer Student Club, they were like, hey, make sure you have a Facebook page don't worry, you don't have to do anything with it. It's just there because you need to have a presence. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, what does that say about social media and, and how you're building a brand and where you put yourself, you know? Yeah, it could definitely be overwhelming, right? Yeah. All the, all the pressures and, you know, like I'm really, somebody put a video, like don't believe it in social media. Mm -hmm. There's a pitch this guy on, on vacation, but it's like this fake picture, you know, I'm in the backyard with a fake thing on, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's not, well, it's like, I don't. It's not real life. How are you supposed to be authentic? Um, in a space where maybe other people are not being authentic mm -hmm. and where you, you've you read the research and you understand that people look at your content and might feel badly about themselves. Yeah. So they want, oh, they want this happy life, you know, yeah. happy go lucky. Yeah. No one really says, oh man, last month my life's been shit. Mm -hmm. I feel to this, I lost a job, blah, 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 you know. Sometimes there are like really cool viral posts I like that are that are just real. And I think that those real posts also kind of feed into this like, um, this like desire to, it's like a desire for trauma. Mm -hmm. It's like a, um, people really want to keep sharing trauma and they think that that's helpful. And it's just not, I just, social media, did you know Twitter was based off of something called text mob? I remember that, yeah. Yeah. And like that, I love that text mob was this like, you know, um, we're going to help activists communicate. And it's going to have this like cool social justice movement. I mean, the Arab Spring. Yeah, all Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a really cool tool for being for mass communication, but can also be misused. Yeah. Um, and so how do you I think that's one example of like, yes, no. And I don't know how you separate that without odd regulations and things that yeah. don't feel right. Is it free speech? Is it not, you know, right. or is a private company is too big is public, you know? Well, it's a question about free will, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't I don't know if we actually have free will about the things that we say. And we, I would love to say that everything I put together is like, I'm actively choosing. There's just so many influences. Right. 
And I, and I think that that helps me question what I do when I'm interacting on the internet. And I, I, there's that book called subliminal where you're so, again, so just subconsciously told things. Um, I, I, there was a thought experiment I was recently engaged in about what if we had like politicians that were voted in by, or just random like jury selection, you know? So you get random politicians in there from all walks of life, just trying to do politics. And I, I was really kind of against it because I felt it would immediately, um, you would immediately have companies and interests finding subversive ways to influence this. Mm. It, it, you can't escape it, you know? The culture machine eats us all. No doubt, no doubt. Mm. One thing about the generation now, I mean, that's so tech advanced, right? I mean, mm. like my generation, you know, dollar phones, AOL, you know, the, 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 the transition, you know, the pains, you know, having like text one letter at a time, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the keyboard, you know, <laughs> you know, it, you know, you, if someone called, you had no idea who it was until you answer the phone, right? right? You know, you had to risk it until caller ID. Yeah. You could call people back, but you could block your caller. ID. Yeah. I remember you want to know how hot it was. You had to call this phone number for the time and temperature. I had to get my movie times. I had to call a phone number to get movie times at the local cinema. And you had to wait for your movie. You couldn't just choose your movie. I mean, the future, you might be born and have a tip involved in Saudi, right? All With there. all the, here's the words, all the words information since mm -hmm. the beginning of time in your chip, so you know everything, right? You just access it. Yeah. Through your fingers. Through your, yeah. I think that AR with the glasses, I've always wanted to try this glass. Mm -hmm. I think it's given a lot of people headaches and I would probably hate that. But the concept of being able to have things in your environment, yeah. you know, and to access it all. Doctor Who wears sunglasses. Does. Peter Capaldi's character. Yeah, you would like it. I'm gonna have to check it out. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's been on around since the fifties. Yeah, he has what, a sonic screwdriver. What, what channel does it come on? Like what, what, BBC. Oh, BBC. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But you can access it on Amazon Prime. Okay, nice. Um, so I asked you before about women in tech. Mm -hmm. Advice for them. What advice do you have just like regular junior developers trying to find a job? Like I right out, right out of college, right out of coding academy. Mm -hmm. So, well, so one thing I think a lot of developers get wrong. Junior developers they're, they're complaining all the time. It says I need two years of experience. I've got a college. Well, mm -hmm. they expect you to like have an internship, have something, or at least two years of work on GitHub. Doesn't mean actually mean you have to have a job for two years, but right. you got to be able to translate the experience. I think I think mm -hmm. a lot of them get that wrong. Um, a lot of them want to fit the job description perfectly, and they're not going to. No. If you fit like sixty percent of it, you dive into it, apply, make a case for yourself. But also, I think that what's really, really important is um, some people think I need to do internships in order to get a job. And sometimes internships are not accessible because mm. maybe you have children, right? Mm. Maybe you can't travel the world and do all these things because of whatever constraint mm. in your life. You can do something free, like the Google Developer Student mm. Club. You could develop a community, show that you have leadership, show that you can make projects, show that you can do something from Take start a free to Python course on whatever. Yeah. And Go to meetups. And have a portfolio. And follow follow tech people. The moment that you start act, like actively participating in these kinds of things, you're going to create all the answers to those behavioral questions that come up. You know, well, you had to design a database. If you, either you do it on your own time or you do it for an employer, there's going to be a little difference there mm -hmm. about constraints. But if you're good, you would have had constraints that you're already working with in your own personal project that you would be able to convey to that interviewee. So, you know, it's not about waiting until you graduate. There was somebody recently who like was like, I'm not going to do LinkedIn. Why, why not? I'm not looking for a job. You're, you're missing a point. You need to hop on there right now. I, I actually considered um, having a LinkedIn for my children mm -hmm. at some point, not yet, but yeah. there's going to be a point where I'm going to want to teach them. You need to have a presence that's public and it needs to be accessible and people need to be able to see who you are. So for my tech startup, right? Um, so a few months ago, I took part in, uh, you know what Y Combinator is? Mm -mm. So like this, uh, it's an accelerator, right? Where like, they invest in startups. So I think our startup school, I took startup school, like an eight week course, you know, right. daily updates. It's like a form, right? And so this lady, a Teddy Cobb, one of theirs, her, her startup is called Empowerly. They do, they give you internships for your startup, right? But the high school students, right? And so it is all these high school students. So that they're trying to get like MIT, Stanford, all these high advanced schools, like having like the SATs, how to do interviews, right? And part of it, like an internship, right? So I have like 12 of them working for me this summer, right? 12 high school students, right? I made them all get on long LinkedIn, right? Like I told him how to set it up, what you need it for. Like, I'm too young for this. No, this, I told him like, you know, here's the people I know. Like one person, he wants to be like an author, right? Mm -hmm. Here's all my people I follow author, right? Tell them you know me and connect with them, right? Yeah. So I'm trying um, to do that for him. Well, like I met you through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I've met people at Google through LinkedIn. 
I've had mentorships through LinkedIn and it's all because maybe they posted something that resonated yeah. and you have like the courage to direct message them and be like, Hey, I really like that. And being specific, it doesn't, yeah. there's like this uh, critique about networking being inauthentic. It doesn't have to be no. inauthentic. It can be really genuine and like, wow, I really love that you are being able to put yourself out on your LinkedIn page so transparently with whatever you care about, X, Y, Z. Um, I want to know more about that. And how about we go have coffee? And then all of a sudden that person knows a person who yeah. knows a person. And then that network, yeah. 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 From my experience, like 9% of people on LinkedIn like want to help you out yeah. and stuff. Of course, there's a 10% like, dude, what are you doing? Like I, I was telling someone earlier today I was talking to, like, like every day I get at least one LinkedIn message from a business coach. Hey, Jason, like, what are you doing? If you join my webinar, I'll increase your revenue by 20,000%, uh -huh. blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And he's like a finance coach or like some something not related to what I'm doing, right? Or he's like, hey, yeah, it's like ridiculous. It's like obvious that they're mass sending out emails. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the worst one recently, it, it was hard to tell whether it was personal or not. Mm -hmm. And usually I know that it's not, but this yeah. one was really good. And I communicated that to them. Mm -hmm. I said, look, this sounds really genuine, but I honestly can't tell whether yeah. you're just trying to exploit me because I'm here on LinkedIn yeah. or if like, you're just really asking me questions. So yeah. if you could let me know, that yeah. would be great. And they never talk to me ever again. Yeah. Okay, I, I mean, automation is good or bad. Like you have like 10,000 people. How are you going to send an individual message? There's right. like, one, you can't do that. Right. Right. There was, but then oh, you can't be like, you know, like too spammy, I guess, you know, that right. Like there was uh, for the Google developer student club, we were doing a uh, global event and I needed to get all of the other, this was my plan. I wanted to get all the other Google developer student clubs who have their own websites and communities. I needed all of them to promote my event and you could post it in a main channel and you know, who's going to respond to it. Three people are going to thumbs up yeah. it, but in order to get engagement, you meet you directly contact. And I get mm -hmm. 170 of these different people from across the United States and Canada. And like maybe 70% responded, mm -hmm. but that is a huge return on investment. Of yeah. Time. I mean, I mean, statutory is always better to do one-on-one -on -one versus yeah. automation. This thing that you're trying to reach 10,000 people, like yeah. unless you're like hire VAs or something like that, you know, yeah. it's painstakingly painful. Like, it's frustrating if you want to, and then maybe, maybe that's a, an indication that sometimes our market should be smaller. Mm -hmm. Like I understand that there's a competitive market to be national and to be big, but what if we all just kept focusing on like, our small spaces and had really impact and engagement in that space. Is that sustainable? I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. But. It's tough, you know, unless you mm -hmm. learn how to code AI and, you know, do your, your, your LinkedIn messaging for you from, from right. AI robot, you know, there was somebody who did that. They had a really cool, like happy birthday message to me. And I was like, man, that was so cool. And I remember the person being like, haha, what a, what a good bot. Like, <laughs> Oh, thanks. Yeah. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is good too. You know, I, I like to say like, I love it. I hate it. Right. Right. It's, um, it's done almost nothing but, but good things for me. And I think no, it's same a, here, same here, yeah. Yeah. And it's a good way, a good way to find maybe who you are. When mm. I, when I see certain messages, I've also learned a lot of control. If I see something political, like I, I think LinkedIn has taught me because it's such a professional space. Mm. There's a very fine line. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I just, over the years, I, I just understand like, don't engage, don't engage that. Maybe just read it, yeah. get involved, maybe get emotional response out of it personally. Yeah. But I, I do think some people, put, you know, of course, put you want, you know, my thing is like, you don't like to scroll, mm -hmm. but some people like to think per, too personal. Like I know that sometimes people will put like, you know, yesterday my blank died, you know, mm -hmm. I'm feeling bad a day. Like, shouldn't you be like, take care of something, right? Like, why are you on LinkedIn posting about this? Like yeah. your wife, your dad, whatever died. Like, shouldn't you be like, you know, of course, maybe it's a way like, you know, grieve or whatever, you know, so you mm -hmm. don't know, but it's just always like wonder about that, right? Yeah. Well, there's, because there's so many different, it's like a, a portfolio of your brand, mm -hmm. you know, here's my personal life. Here's my family life. Here's, you know, and on LinkedIn, it's my professional life. And I think that some of us, myself included, put so much effort into one space. Mm -hmm. Like if I don't have other ones, mm -hmm. how do you show people that other side of you? Yeah. And I, I don't know what the answer is. Mine is just private, but I've seen a lot of people do like their weight loss journeys yeah. on LinkedIn. And you're like, I mean, I, I am rooting for you mm -hmm. and that is great, but. Yeah, just scroll. Yeah. Yeah. Like two examples. I have a person I follow. She's like a recruiter. She's a recruiter advice. She's like their everyday posts and comments, real positive. Mm -hmm. She'd have posted a couple of days ago, like, hey, you know, my brother died. I'll be off the platform for like two weeks, you know? Yeah. Okay, I got that right. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other one, this happened a long time ago. This young lady, 
it's like two minute video. It was her getting out of the shower with a bath towel on, playing hide and go seek with the dog, right? Hmm. And people were like blasting, like, what is this craziness? And someone said, no, it's not craziness. It's showing her personality. Mm -hmm. So her future job would say, hey, this is her personality. Do you want her or not, right? Man, that kind of makes sense. I never thought about yes. it like that, you know? But if you're, if you're researching an employee, and to be very clear, I've never done that. I've never, I've heard people doing it, but I would, I've never like gone on and been like, who is this person on? So I probably should. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing that, you're going to come up with Facebook. You're going to come yeah. up with all these other things that have over a decade worth of information on you. And I think in my mind, if I keep it compartmentalized, if people are only interested in, you know, I don't know, it's a, that's an interesting thing to think about, especially for self-promotion. Mm. And again, and self-promotion is not for power. It's not for anything other than how do you in this current market, um, make sure that you are a voice in a crowd of people. And I think it's, I think it's through things like this. I think it's through LinkedIn. I think it's through doing blogs, oddly, like um, publishing on like Medium or something. And I don't know what else, if I had the magic formula. I'm just glad there was no social media back in my day. <laughs> we didn't have any either. What did we, I remember MySpace. Yeah, I remember, remember that, that one. one. And you could customize your MySpace. I remember thinking I was like amazing when I was able to like update my background to MySpace. When we had AOL. Yeah. Yeah. And Yahoo Messenger, I think was a thing. But what it did is it opened up, um, we think about now, you were talking to um, your most recent guest about uh, Discord mm -hmm. and building a Discord community and how it's a lot like, it, is, it does, it's kind of nostalgic. And the individuals, the older individuals like myself, you know, the 30 and 40 year olds who come in are like, this is a mess. I've heard it a million times. And I'm like, well, yeah, the name, right? It's, it's yeah, Discord, the name, right? Right, it's right there. Uh, but it's, you just have to remind them, like, just remember those forums that we were in. Remember the, the ASL and the, the different acronyms that we used? Same concept. Same concept, just dark mode and mm -hmm. dive in. Yeah. And you're going to get lost in it. It's going to be fine. There was a faculty member who, like, refused to go on to our Discord for a long time. That's where his students were. They didn't want to participate in his online forum that he had on his student stuff. You gotta go they were all on you have to go to where the community is at. Exactly. He hopped, he refused to at first. He's like, there's no way to organize this. And I was like, you just have to be present. It can't be asynchronous. You have to be like in the flow, in the current with them. Do that for an hour and you're fine. You can leave and come back on your own terms. That's how Discord works. If you wanted to have like an email system, mm -hmm. good luck, but it's a little different. And there's a place, there's a place for synchronous and asynchronous interaction. But it's funny how like some teams like change, but I don't change, right? Kind of like, like the current generation, they got off like for like drinking White Claws, right? Mm -hmm. But back in the day, they weren't drunk Zimas, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, what's the difference between Zimas or White Claws? It's like it's it's the same thing, right? Yeah. It's the same thing, White Claws, those, Zima. Those small, cute skinny cans. Yeah. Based, uh, they were based on Red Bulls, maybe, mm -hmm. and so it's that nostalgic. That nostalgic, mm -mm. Gosh. I wonder what our kids like will end up, the, the, at least the youngest generation right now. I think about this all the time. Like, what are you? What are you going to be into in a decade? Was that, did you experience that? Like, did you, when you, when your kids finally got into like their later teens, did you have? The stuff I, I've never experience? imagined they would do, right? Really? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like, like when you, like you knew growing, like you growing up my age, like parents, like could play their video game, get out, you know, mm -hmm. nowadays, like you make like millions of dollars playing esports or video yeah. games. Like you're not going outside a day, you get, get your butt back in your chair and you're in fact that video <laughs> game, right? I love that meme where it's like, um, don't be on your computer all day. And then it's the, it's that cute puppet that's mm -hmm. like, but engineer, you make yeah. so much money. I love that. This concept of, we used to think reading was really bad, right? Mm -hmm. And now there was video games. I don't know about you, but I played a lot of Zelda and mm -hmm. a lot of Mario. I played a lot of Nintendo when I was little. Mm -hmm. And now, now what is it? I guess it's, it's still video games. Video games, Fortnite is the big one, I think. Yeah, yeah. But these video games are different. They're more subscription based. They're yeah. more, I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. It, like money. nowadays, like you have to play for the console, mm -hmm. you get one game, you have to play like the subscription models and yeah. you have to like upcharge, you get do different things. Yeah. It's, like, it's almost like a scheme nowadays. Roblox. Right. Have you heard about Roblox? Yeah. Yeah. So I found, I would never, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put money into it, but I know a few other parents do. At first they trickle a couple dollars in and then they like, 
they just find. And, and before you need. know, it's part of your family budget. A car. <laughs> yes. I got an electric bill, Roblox. Mm -hmm. I need to pay for my server for Minecraft. Yeah. I need to pay for my server for Ark. I need Roblox bucks. And, you know, just like pick your flavor. Pick your flavor of video game that your kids need to pay for. And kids want it. You know, they think it's like everybody else is getting it. And I also want it. Man, my parents didn't pay for it. Maybe they would have. Cave. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Hey, so we're coming in of our talk. Um, this has been a great conversation. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, I think as far as advice is concerned, uh, something I want to impart to the world is um, not that you, you just have to let go and understand that what other people think of you, it just isn't is not your concern and that you need to just push forward. You need to be empathetic. You need to be concerning for other individuals' interests check in and check in often, but ultimately you can't control it. And I think that's, that's something we try to grapple with, with social media and with our personal brand. We want to control people's thoughts of us, but you got to let it go. Just be yourself. Amanda, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.